Section one of Monsieur Lecoq, Part one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Margaret Espayat. Monsieur Lecoq by Emile Gaboriau, Part one, Section one. At about eleven o'clock in the evening of the twentieth of February, eighteen sixty, which chanced to be Shrove Sunday, a party of detectives left the police station near the old Barrière d'Italie to the direct south of Paris. Their mission was to explore the district extending on the one hand between the high road to Fontainebleau and the Seine, and on the other between the outer boulevards and the fortifications. This quarter of the city had at that time anything but an enviable reputation. To venture there at night was considered so dangerous that the soldiers from the outlying forts who came into Paris with permission to go to the theatre were ordered to halt at the barrière and not to pass through the perilous district excepting in parties of three or four. After midnight these gloomy, narrow streets became the haunt of numerous homeless vagabonds, and escaped criminals and malefactors, moreover, made the quarter their rendezvous. If the day had been a lucky one, they made merry over their spoils, and, when sleep overtook them, hid in doorways or among the rubbish in deserted houses. Every effort had been made to dislodge these dangerous guests, but the most energetic measures had failed to prove successful. Watched, hunted, and in imminent danger of arrest though they were, they always returned with idiotic obstinacy, obeying, as one might suppose, some mysterious law of attraction. Hence the district was for the police an immense trap, constantly baited, and to which the game came of their own accord to be caught. The result of a tour of inspection of this locality was so certain that the officer in charge of the police post called to the squad as they departed, "'I'll prepare lodgings for our guests. Good luck to you and much pleasure.' This last wish was pure irony, for the weather was the most disagreeable that could be imagined. A very heavy snowstorm had prevailed for several days. It was now beginning to thaw and on all the frequented thoroughfares the slush was ankle-deep. It was still cold, however, a damp chill filled the air, and penetrated to the very marrow of one's bones. Besides, there was a dense fog, so dense that one could not see one's hands before one's face. "'What a beastly job!' growled one of the agents. "'Yes,' replied the inspector who commanded the squad. "'If you had an income of thirty thousand francs, I don't suppose you'd be here.' The laugh that greeted this commonplace joke was not so much flattery as homage to a recognized and established superiority. The inspector was, in fact, one of the most esteemed members of the force, a man who had proved his worth. His powers of penetration were not perhaps very great, but he thoroughly understood his profession, its resources, its labyrinths, and its artifices. Long practice had given him imperturbable coolness, a great confidence in himself, and a sort of coarse diplomacy that supplied the place of shrewdness. To his failings and his virtues he added incontestable courage, and he would lay his hand upon the collar of the most dangerous criminal as tranquilly as a devotee dips his fingers in a basin of holy water. He was a man about forty-six years of age, strongly built, with rugged features, a heavy moustache, and rather small grey eyes, hidden by bushy eyebrows. His name was Gevrol, but he was universally known as the General. This sobriquet was pleasing to his vanity, which was not slight, as his subordinates well knew, and doubtless he felt that he ought to receive from them the same consideration as was due to a person of that exalted rank. "'If you begin to complain already,' he added gruffly, "'what will you do by and by?' In fact, it was too soon to complain. The little party were then passing along the Rue de Choisy. The people on the footways were orderly, and the lights of the wine-shops illuminated the street. All these places were open. There is no fog or thaw that is potent enough to dismay lovers of pleasure. 
and a boisterous crowd of maskers filled each tavern and public ballroom. Through the open windows came alternately the sounds of loud voices and bursts of noisy music. Occasionally a drunken man staggered along the pavement, or a masked figure crept by in the shadow cast by the houses. Before certain establishments Gevrol commanded a halt. He gave a peculiar whistle, and almost immediately a man came out. This was another member of the force. His report was listened to, and then the squad passed on. "'To the left, boys,' ordered Gevrol. "'We will take the Rue d'Ivry, and then cut through the shortest way to the Rue de Chevalry. From this point the expedition became really disagreeable. The way led through an unfinished, unnamed street, full of puddles and deep holes, and obstructed with all sorts of rubbish. There were no longer any lights or crowded wine-shops. No footsteps, no voices were heard. Solitude, gloom, and an almost perfect silence prevailed, and one might have supposed oneself a hundred leagues from Paris, had it not been for the deep and continuous murmur that always arises from a large city, resembling the hollow roar of a torrent in some cavern depth. All the men had turned up their trousers and were advancing slowly, picking their way as carefully as an Indian when he is stealing upon his prey. They had just passed the Rue du Château de Rentier when suddenly a wild shriek rent the air. At this place, and at this hour, such a cry was so frightfully significant that all the men paused as if by common impulse. "'Did you hear that, General?' asked one of the detectives in a low voice. "'Yes, there is murder going on not far from here. But where? Silence, let us listen.' They all stood motionless, holding their breath, and anxiously listening. Soon a second cry, or rather a wild howl, resounded. Ah! exclaimed the inspector, it is at the poivriere. This peculiar appellation, poivriere, or pepper box, was derived from the term peppered, which in French slang is applied to a man who has left his good sense at the bottom of his glass. Hence also the sobriquet of pepper thieves, given to the rascals whose specialty it is to plunder helpless, inoffensive drunkards. What? added Gevrol to his companions. Don't you know Mother Chupin's drinking shop there on the right? Run! And, setting the example, he dashed off in the direction indicated. His men followed, and in less than a minute they reached a hovel of sinister aspect, standing alone in a tract of waste ground. It was indeed from this den that the cries had proceeded. They were now repeated, and were immediately followed by two pistol shots. The house was hermetically closed, but through the cracks in the window-shutters gleamed a reddish light like that of a fire. One of the police agents darted to one of these windows, and raising himself up by clinging to the shutters with his hands, endeavored to peer through the cracks and to see what was passing within. Gevrol himself ran to the door. "'Open!' he commanded, striking it heavily. No response came. But they could hear plainly enough the sound of a terrible struggle of fierce imprecations, hollow groans, and occasionally the sobs of a woman. "'Horrible!' cried the police agent who was peering through the shutters. "'It is horrible!' This exclamation decided Gevrol. "'Open in the name of the law!' he cried a third time. And, no one responding, with a blow of the shoulder that was as violent as a blow from a battering ram, he dashed open the door. Then the horror-stricken accent of the man who had been peering through the shutters was explained. The room presented such a spectacle that all the agents, and even Gevrol himself, remained for a moment rooted to the threshold, shuddering with unspeakable horror. Everything denoted that the house had been the scene of a terrible struggle, of one of those savage conflicts which only too often stain the barrière drinking dens with blood. The lights had been extinguished at the beginning of the strife, but a blazing fire of pine logs illuminated even the furthest corners of the room. Tables, glasses, decanters, household utensils, and stools had been overturned, thrown in every direction, trodden upon, shivered into fragments. Near the fireplace two men lay stretched upon the floor. They were lying motionless upon their backs with their arms crossed. A third was extended in the middle of the room. 
a woman crouched upon the lower steps of a staircase leading to the floor above. She had thrown her apron over her head, and was uttering inarticulate moans. Finally, facing the police, and with his back turned to an open door leading into an adjoining room, stood a young man, in front of whom a heavy oaken table formed, as it were, a rampart. He was of medium stature, and wore a full beard. His clothes, not unlike those of a railway porter, were torn to fragments, and soiled with dust and wine and blood. This certainly was the murderer. The expression on his face was terrible. A mad fury blazed in his eyes, and a convulsive sneer distorted his features. On his neck and cheek were two wounds which bled profusely. In his right hand, covered with a handkerchief, he held a pistol which he aimed at the intruders. "'Surrender!' cried Gévrol. The man's lips moved, but, in spite of a visible effort, he could not articulate a syllable. "'Don't do any mischief,' continued the inspector. "'We are in force. You cannot escape, so lay down your arms.' "'I am innocent,' exclaimed the man, in a hoarse, strained voice. "'Naturally, but we do not see it.' "'I have been attacked. Ask that old woman. I defended myself. I have killed. I had a right to do so. It was in self-defense. The gesture with which he enforced these words was so menacing that one of the agents drew Gevrol violently aside, saying as he did so, "'Take care, General. Take care. The revolver. The revolver has five barrels, and we have heard but two shots.' But the inspector was inaccessible to fear. He freed himself from the grasp of his subordinate, and again stepped forward, speaking in a still calmer tone. "'No foolishness, my lad.' If your case is a good one, which is possible, after all, don't spoil it." A frightful indecision betrayed itself on the young man's features. He held Gevrol's life at the end of his finger. Was he about to press the trigger? No. He suddenly threw his weapon to the floor, exclaiming, "'Come and take me!' And turning as he spoke, he darted into the adjoining room, hoping doubtless to escape by some means of egress which he knew of. Gevrol had expected this movement. He sprang after him with outstretched arms, but the table retarded his pursuit. "'Ah!' he exclaimed, "'the wretch escapes us!' But the fate of the fugitive was already decided. While Gevrol parlayed, one of the agents, he who had peered through the shutters, had gone to the rear of the house and effected an entrance through the back door. As the murderer darted out, this man sprang upon him, seized him, and, with surprising strength and agility, dragged him back. The murderer tried to resist, but in vain. He had lost his strength. He tottered and fell upon the table that had momentarily protected him, murmuring loud enough for every one to hear, "'Lost! It is the Prussians who are coming!' This simple and decisive maneuver on the part of the subordinate had won the victory, and at first it greatly delighted the inspector. "'Good, my boy,' said he, "'very good. Ah, you have a talent for your business, and you will do well if ever an opportunity.' But he checked himself. All his followers so evidently shared his enthusiasm that a feeling of jealousy overcame him. He felt his prestige diminishing, and hastened to add, "'The idea had occurred to me, but I could not give the order without warning the scoundrel himself.' This remark was superfluous. All the police agents had now gathered around the murderer. They began by binding his feet and hands, and then fastened him securely to a chair. He offered no resistance. His wild excitement had given place to that gloomy prostration that follows all unnatural efforts, either of mind or body. Evidently he had abandoned himself to his fate. When Gevrol saw that the men had finished their task, he called on them to attend to the other inmates of the den, and, in addition, ordered the lamps to be lit, for the fire was going out. The inspector began his examination with the two men lying near the fireplace. He laid his hand on their hearts, but no pulsations were to be detected. He then held the face of his watch close to their lips, but the glass remained quite clear. "'Useless,' he murmured after several trials. 
Useless. They're dead. They will never see mourning again. Leave them in the same position until the arrival of the public prosecutor. And let us look at the other one. The third man still breathed. He was a young fellow, wearing the uniform of a common soldier of the line. He was unarmed, and his large bluish-gray cloak was partly open, revealing his bare chest. The agents lifted him very carefully, for he groaned piteously at the slightest movement, and placed him in an upright position, with his back leaning against the wall. He soon opened his eyes, and in a faint voice asked for something to drink. They brought him a glass of water, which he drank with evident satisfaction. He then drew a long breath, and seemed to regain some little strength. "'Where are you wounded?' asked Chevron. "'In the head, there,' he responded, trying to raise one of his arms. "'Oh, how I suffer!' The police agent, who had cut off the murderer's retreat, now approached, and, with a dexterity that an old surgeon might have envied, made an examination of the gaping wound which the young man had received in the back of the neck. "'It is nothing,' declared the police agent, but as he spoke there was no mistaking the movement of his lower lip. It was evident that he considered the wound very dangerous, probably mortal. "'It will be nothing,' affirmed Chevrol in his turn. "'Wounds in the head, when they do not kill at once, are cured in a month.' The wounded man smiled sadly. "'I have received my death-blow,' he murmured. "'Nonsense!' "'Oh, it is useless to say anything. I feel it, but I do not complain. I have only received my just deserts. All the police agents turned toward the murderer on hearing these words, presuming that he would take advantage of this opportunity to repeat his protestations of innocence. But their expectations were disappointed. He did not speak, although he must certainly have heard the words. "'It was that brigand.' Lacheneur, who enticed me here, continued the wounded man, in a voice that was growing fainter. Lacheneur? Yes, Jean Lacheneur, a former actor who knew me when I was rich, for I had a fortune, but I spent it all. I wished to amuse myself. He, knowing I was without a single sou in the world, came and promised me money enough to begin life over again. Fool that I was to believe him, for he brought me to die here like a dog. Oh, I will have my revenge on him. At this thought, the wounded man clenched his hands threateningly. I will have my revenge, he resumed. I know much more than he believes. I will reveal everything. But he had presumed too much upon his strength. Anger had given him a moment's energy but at the cost of his life, which was ebbing away. When he again tried to speak, he could not. Twice did he open his lips, but only a choking cry of impotent rage escaped them. This was his last manifestation of intelligence. A bloody foam gathered upon his lips, his eyes rolled back in their sockets, his body stiffened, and he fell face downward in a terrible convulsion. It is over, murmured Gevrol. Not yet, replied the young police agent, who had shown himself so proficient. But he cannot live more than two minutes. Poor devil! He will say nothing. The inspector of police had risen from the floor as if he had just witnessed the commonest incident in the world, and was carefully dusting the knees of his trousers. Oh, well, he responded, we shall know all we need to know. This fellow is a soldier, and the number of his regiment will be given on the buttons of his cloak. A slight smile curved the lips of the subordinate. I think you are mistaken, General, said he. How? Yes, I understand. Seeing him attired in a military coat, you supposed. But no, this poor wretch was no soldier. Do you wish for an immediate proof? Is his hair the regulation cut? Where did you ever see soldiers with their hair falling over their shoulders? This objection silenced the general for a moment, but he replied brusquely, "'Do you think that I keep my eyes in my pocket? What you have remarked did not escape my notice. Only, I said to myself, here is a young man who has profited by leave of absence to visit the wig-maker.' "'At least,' but Gevrol would permit no more interruptions. 
"'Enough talk,' he declared. "'We will now hear what has happened. "'Mother Chupin, the old hussy, is not dead.' "'As he spoke, he advanced toward the old woman, "'who was still crouching upon the stairs. "'She had not moved nor ventured so much as a look "'since the entrance of the police, "'but her moans had not been discontinued. "'With a sudden movement, Gevrol tore off the apron which she had thrown over her head, and there she stood, such as years, vice, poverty, and drink had made her, wrinkled, shriveled, toothless, and haggard, her skin as yellow and as dry as parchment, and drawn tightly over her bones. "'Come, stand up,' ordered the inspector. "'Your lamentations don't affect me. You ought to be sent to prison for putting such vile drugs into your liquors.' thus breeding madness in the brains of your customers the old woman's little red eyes travelled slowly round the room and then in tearful tones she exclaimed what a misfortune what will become of me everything is broken i am ruined she only seemed impressed by the loss of her table utensils now tell us how this trouble began said gevrol alas i know nothing about it I was upstairs mending my son's clothes when I heard a dispute. And after that? Of course I came down, and I saw those three men that are lying there picking a quarrel with the young man you have arrested, the poor innocent, for he is innocent, as truly as I am an honest woman. If my son Polite had been here he would have separated them. But I, a poor widow, what could I do? I cried police with all my might. After giving this testimony she resumed her seat, thinking she had said enough. But Gevrol rudely ordered her to stand up again. "'Oh, we have not done,' said he. "'I wish for other particulars.' "'What particulars, dear Monsieur Gevrol, since I saw nothing?' Anger crimsoned the inspector's ears. "'What would you say, old woman, if I arrested you?' "'It would be a great piece of injustice.' Nevertheless, it is what will happen if you persist in remaining silent. I have an idea that a fortnight in St. Lazare would untie your tongue. These words produced the effect of an electric shock on the widow Chupin. She suddenly ceased her hypocritical lamentations, rose, placed her hands defiantly on her hips, and poured forth a torrent of invective upon Gevrol and his agents, accusing them of persecuting her family ever since they had previously arrested her son, a good-for-nothing fellow. Finally she swore that she was not afraid of prison, and would be only too glad to end her days in jail beyond the reach of want. At first the general tried to impose silence upon the terrible termagant, but he soon discovered that he was powerless. Besides, all his subordinates were laughing. Accordingly, he turned his back upon her, and, advancing toward the murderer, he said, "'You, at least, will not refuse an explanation.' The man hesitated for a moment. "'I have already said all that I have to say,' he replied at last. "'I have told you that I am innocent, and this woman and a man on the point of death who was struck down by my hand have both confirmed my declaration. What more do you desire?' When the judge questions me, I will perhaps reply. Until then do not expect another word from me. It was easy to see that the fellow's resolution was irrevocable, and that he was not to be daunted by any inspector of police. Criminals frequently preserve an absolute silence, from the very moment they are captured. These men are experienced and shrewd, and lawyers and judges pass many sleepless nights on their account. They have learned that a system of defense cannot be improvised at once, that it is, on the contrary, a work of patience and meditation, and knowing what a terrible effect an apparently insignificant response drawn from them at the moment of detection may produce on a court of justice, they remain obstinately silent. So as to see whether the present culprit was an old hand or not, Gevrol was about to insist on a full explanation when someone announced that the soldier had just breathed his last. "'As that is so, my boys,' the inspector remarked, two of you will remain here, and I will leave with the others. I shall go and arouse the commissary of police, and inform him of the affair. He will take the matter in hand, and we can then do whatever he commands. 
My responsibility will be over in any case, so untie our prisoner's legs and bind Mother Chupin's hands, and we will drop them both at the station-house as we pass. The men hastened to obey, with the exception of the youngest among them, the same who had won the general's passing praise. He approached his chief, and motioning that he desired to speak with him, drew him outside the door. When they were a few steps from the house, Gevrol asked him what he wanted. "'I wish to know, General, what you think of this affair.' "'I think, my boy, that four scoundrels encountered each other in this vile den. They began to quarrel, and from words they came to blows. One of them had a revolver, and he killed the others. It is as clear as daylight, and according to the antecedents of the victims the assassin will be judged. Perhaps society owes him some thanks.' "'And you think that any investigation, any further search, is unnecessary?' "'Entirely unnecessary.' The younger man appeared to deliberate for a moment. "'It seems to me, General,' he at length replied, "'that this affair is not perfectly clear. "'Have you noticed the murderer, remarked his demeanour, and observed his look? "'Have you been surprised, as I have been? "'By what?' "'Ah, uh, well, it seems to me—' I may, of course, be mistaken, but I fancy that appearances are deceitful, and—yes, I suspect something. Bah! Explain yourself, please. How can you explain the dog's faculty of scent? Gevrol shrugged his shoulders. In short, he replied, you scent a melodrama here, a rendezvous of gentlemen in disguise, here at the Poivriere, at Mother Chupin's house. "'Well, hunt after the mystery, my boy. Search all you like. You have my permission.' "'What? You will allow me?' "'I not only allow you. I order you to do it. "'You are going to remain here with any one of your comrades you may select, "'and if you find anything that I have not seen, "'I will allow you to buy me a pair of spectacles.'" End of section 1「Section two of Monsieur Le Coq, Part one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Margaret Espayat. Monsieur Le Coq by Emile Gaboriau. Part one, Section two. The young police agent to whom Gevrol abandoned what he thought an unnecessary investigation was a debutante in his profession. His name was Lecoq. He was some twenty-five or twenty-six years of age, almost beardless, very pale, with red lips, and an abundance of wavy black hair. He was rather short, but well proportioned, and each of his movements betrayed unusual energy. There was nothing remarkable about his appearance, if we accept his eyes, which sparkled brilliantly, or grew extremely dull according to his mood and his nose, the large full nostrils of which had a surprising mobility. The son of a respectable, well-to-do Norman family, Lecoq had received a good and solid education. He was prosecuting his law studies in Paris when, in the same week, blow following blow, he learned that his father had died, financially ruined, and that his mother had survived him only a few hours. He was left alone in the world, destitute of resources, obliged to earn his living. But how? He had an opportunity of learning his true value, and found that it amounted to nothing, for the university, on bestowing its diploma of bachelor, does not give an annuity with it. Hence, of what use is a college education to a poor orphan boy? He envied the lot of those who, with a trade at the ends of their fingers, could boldly enter the office of any manufacturer and say, I would like to work. Such men were working and eating. Lecoq sought bread by all the methods employed by people who are in reduced circumstances. Fruitless labor. There are a hundred thousand people in Paris who have seen better days. No matter. He gave proofs of undaunted energy. He gave lessons and copied documents for a lawyer. He made his appearance in a new character almost every day, 
and left no means untried to earn an honest livelihood. At last he obtained employment from a well-known astronomer, the Baron Mose, and spent his days in solving bewildering and intricate problems at the rate of a hundred francs a month. But a season of discouragement came. After five years of constant toil, he found himself at the same point from which he had started. He was nearly crazed with rage and disappointment when he recapitulated his blighted hopes, his fruitless efforts, and the insults he had endured. The past had been sad, the present was intolerable, the future threatened to be terrible. Condemned to constant privations, he tried to escape from the horrors of his real life by taking refuge in dreams. Alone in his garret, after a day of unremitting toil, assailed by the thousand longings of youth, Lecoq endeavored to devise some means of suddenly making himself rich. All reasonable methods being beyond his reach, it was not long before he was engaged in devising the worst expedients. In short, this naturally moral and honest young man spent much of his time in perpetrating, in fancy, the most abominable crimes. Sometimes he himself was frightened by the work of his imagination, for an hour of recklessness might suffice to make him pass from the idea to the fact, from theory to practice. This is the case with all monomaniacs. An hour comes in which the strange conceptions that have filled their brains can be no longer held in check. One day he could not refrain from exposing to his patron a little plan he had conceived, which would enable him to obtain five or six hundred francs from London. Two letters and a telegram were all that was necessary, and the game was won. It was impossible to fail, and there was no danger of arousing suspicion. The astronomer, amazed at the simplicity of the plan, could but admire it. On reflection, however, he concluded that it would not be prudent for him to retain so ingenious a secretary in his service. This was why, on the following day, he gave him a month's pay in advance, and dismissed him, saying, "'When one has your disposition and is poor, one may either become a famous thief or a great detective. Choose.' Lecoq retired in confusion, but the astronomer's words bore fruit in his mind. "'Why should I not follow good advice?' he asked himself. Police service did not inspire him with repugnance, far from it. He had often admired that mysterious power, whose hand is everywhere, and which, although unseen and unheard, still manages to hear and see everything. He was delighted with the prospect of being the instrument of such a power. He considered that the profession of detective would enable him to employ the talents with which he had been endowed in a useful and honorable fashion, besides opening out a life of thrilling adventure with fame as its goal. In short, this profession had a wonderful charm for him, so much so that on the following week, thanks to a letter from Baron Mose, he was admitted into the service. A cruel disenchantment awaited him. He had seen the results, but not the means. His surprise was like that of a simple-minded frequenter of the theatre, when he is admitted to the first time behind the scenes, and is able to pry into the decorations and tinsel that are so dazzling at a distance. However, the opportunity for which he had so ardently longed, for which he had been waiting during many weary months, had come, he thought, at last, as he reached the Poivriere with Gevrol and the other police agents. While he was clinging to the window-shutters, he saw by the light of his ambition a pathway to success. It was at first only a presentiment, but it soon became a supposition, and then a conviction based on actual facts which had escaped his companions, but which he had observed carefully and noted. He recognized that fortune had, at last, turned in his favor, when he saw Gevrol neglect all but the merest formalities of examination, and when he heard him declare peremptorily 
that this triple murder was merely the result of one of those ferocious quarrels so frequent among vagrants in the outskirts of the city. "'Ah, well,' he thought, "'have it your own way. Trust in appearances, since you will see nothing beneath them. But I will prove to you that my youthful theory is better than all your experience.' The inspector's carelessness gave Lecoq a perfect right to secretly seek information on his own account, but by warning his superior officers before attempting anything on his own responsibility, he would protect himself against any accusation of ambition or of unduly taking advantage of his comrade. Such charges might prove most dangerous for his future prospects in a profession where so much rivalry is seen and where wounded vanity has so many opportunities to avenge itself by resorting to all sorts of petty treason. Accordingly, he spoke to his superior officer, saying just enough to be able to remark, in case of success, "'Ah, I warned you! Just enough so as not to dispel any of Gevrol's doubts. The permission which Lecoq obtained to remain in charge of the bodies was his first triumph of the best possible augury. But he knew how to dissimulate, and it was in a tone of the utmost indifference that he requested one of his comrades to remain with him. Then, while the others were making ready to depart, he seated himself upon the corner of the table, apparently oblivious of all that was passing around. He did not dare to lift his head, for fear of betraying his joy. So much did he fear that his companions might read his hopes and plans in the expression of his face. Inwardly he was wild with impatience. Though the murderer submitted with good grace to the precautions that were taken to prevent his escape, it required some time to bind the hands of the widow Chupin, who fought and howled as if they were burning her alive. "'They will never go,' Lecoq murmured to himself." They did so at last, however. Gevrol gave the order to start, and left the house, addressing a laughing good-bye to his subordinate. The latter made no reply. He followed his comrades as far as the threshold, to make sure that they were really going, for he trembled at the thought that Gevrol might reflect, change his mind, and return to solve the mystery, as was his right. His anxiety was needless, however. The squad gradually faded away in the distance, and the cries of Widow Chupin died away in the stillness of the night. It was only then that Lecoq re-entered the room. He could no longer conceal his delight. His eyes sparkled as might those of a conqueror taking possession of some vast empire. He stamped his foot upon the floor, and exclaimed with exultation, "'Now the mystery belongs to us two alone!' End of section 2Authorized by Gevrol to choose one of his comrades to remain with him at the Poivriere, Lecoq had requested the least intelligent of the party to keep him company. He was not influenced by a fear of being obliged to share the fruits of success with his companion, but by the necessity of having an assistant from whom he could, in case of need, exact implicit obedience. The comrade Lecoq selected was a man of about fifty, who, after a term of cavalry service, had become an agent of the prefecture. In the humble office that he occupied he had seen prefect succeed prefect, and might probably have filled an entire prison with the culprits he had arrested with his own hands. Experience had not, however, made him any the shrewder or any the more zealous. Still he had this merit. When he received an order he executed it with military exactitude, so far as he understood it. Of course, if he had failed to understand it, so much the worse. It might indeed be said of him that he discharged his duties like a blind man, like an old horse trained for a riding school. When he had a moment's leisure, and a little money in his pocket, he invariably got drunk. 
Indeed, he spent his life between two fits of intoxication, without ever rising above a condition of semi-lucidity. His comrades had known but forgotten his name, and his partiality for a certain beverage had accordingly induced them to call him Father Absinthe. With his limited powers of observation, he naturally did not observe the tone of triumph in his young companion's voice. "'Upon my word,' he remarked when they were alone, "'your idea of keeping me here was a good one, and I thank you for it. While the others spend the night paddling about in the slush, I shall get a good sleep.' Here he stood, in a room that was splashed with blood, that was shuddering, so to speak, with crime, and yet, face to face with the still warm bodies of three murdered men, he could talk of sleep. But after all, what did it matter to him? He had seen so many similar scenes in his time. And does not habit infallibly lead to professional indifference, making the soldier cool and composed in the midst of conflict, and rendering the surgeon impassable when the patient shrieks and writhes beneath his operating knife? "'I've been upstairs looking about,' pursued Father Absinthe. "'I saw a bed up there, and we can mount guard here by turns.' With an imperious gesture, Lecoq interrupted him. "'You must give up that idea, Father Absinthe,' he said. "'We are not here to sleep, but to collect information, to make the most careful researches, and to note all the probabilities. In a few hours the commissary of police, the legal physician, and the public prosecutor will be here. I wish to have a report ready for them.' This proposition seemed anything but pleasing to the old police agent. "'Ah! What's the use of that?' he exclaimed. "'I know the general. When he goes in search of the commissary, as he has gone this evening, there's nothing more to be done. Do you think you can see anything that he didn't see?' "'I think that Gevrol, like everyone else, is liable to be mistaken. I think that he believes too implicitly in what seems to him evidence.' I could swear that this affair is not what it seems to be, and I am sure that if we like we can discover the mystery which is concealed beneath present appearances. Although Lecoq's vehemence was intense, he did not succeed in making any impression upon his companion, who, with a yawn that threatened to dislocate his jaws, replied, "'Perhaps you are right, but I am going to bed. This need not prevent you from searching around, however.' and if you find anything, you can wake me. Lecoq made no sign of impatience, nor in reality was he impatient. These words afforded him the opportunity for which he was longing. "'You will give me a moment first, he remarked. In five minutes, by your watch, I promise to let you put your finger on the mystery that I suspect here. Well, go on for five minutes. After that you shall be free, Father Absent. Only it is clear that if I unravel the mystery alone— I alone ought to pocket the reward that a solution will certainly bring. At the word reward, the old police agent pricked up his ears. He was dazzled by the vision of an infinite number of bottles of the greenish liquor whose name he bore. "'Convince me, then,' said he, taking a seat upon a stool, which he had lifted from the floor. Lecoq remained standing in front of him. "'To begin with,' he remarked, whom do you suppose the person we have just arrested to be? A porter, probably, or a vagabond. That is to say, a man belonging to the lowest class of society, consequently a fellow without education. Certainly. Lecoq spoke with his eyes fixed upon those of his companion. He distrusted his own powers, as is usual with persons of real merit, but he felt that if he could succeed in making his convictions penetrate his comrade's obtuse mind, their exactitude would be virtually proved. "'And now,' he continued, "'what would you say if I showed you that this young man had received an excellent, even refined, education?' "'I should reply that it was very extraordinary. I should reply that—but what a fool I am! You have not proved it to me yet.' "'But I can do so very easily.' Do you remember the words that he uttered as he fell? Yes, I remember them perfectly. He said, It is the Prussians who are coming. What do you suppose he meant by that? What a question! I should suppose that he did not like the Prussians, and that he supposed he was offering us a terrible insult. Lecoq was waiting anxiously for this response. Ah, well, Father Absinthe, he said gravely, 
you are wrong, quite wrong, and that this man has an education superior to his apparent position is proved by the fact that you did not understand his meaning, nor his intention. It was this single phrase that enlightened me. Father Absinthe's physiognomy expressed the strange and comical perplexity of a man who is so thoroughly mystified that he knows not whether to laugh or to be angry. After reflecting a little, he decided to adopt the latter course. "'You are rather too young to impose upon an old fellow like me,' he remarked. "'I don't like boasters.' "'One moment,' interrupted Lecoq. "'Allow me to explain.' You have certainly heard of a terrible battle which resulted in one of the greatest defeats that ever happened to France, the Battle of Waterloo? I don't see the connection. Answer, if you please. Yes, then, I have heard of it. Very well. You must know, then, that for some time victory likely seemed to rest with the banners of France. The English began to fall back, and the Emperor had already exclaimed, We have them! when suddenly on the right a little in the rear a large body of troops was seen advancing it was the prussian army the battle of waterloo was lost in all his life worthy father absinthe had never made such a strenuous effort to understand anything in this case his perseverance was not wholly useless for springing from his stool and probably in much the same tone that archimedes cried eureka he exclaimed I understand. The man's words were only an illusion. It is as you have said, remarked Lecoq approvingly. But I had not finished. If the emperor was thrown into consternation by the appearance of the Prussians, it was because he was momentarily expecting the arrival of one of his own generals from the same direction, Grouchy, with thirty-five thousand men. So if this man's illusion was exact and complete, he was not expecting an enemy, but a friend. Now draw your own conclusions. Father Absinthe was amazed, but convinced, and his eyes, heavy with sleep a few moments before, now opened to their widest extent. "'Good heavens!' he murmured. "'If you put it in that way. But I forget, you must have seen something as you were looking through the shutters.' The young man shook his head. "'Upon my honor," he declared, I saw nothing save the struggle between the murderer and the poor devil dressed as a soldier. It was that sentence alone that aroused my attention. "'Wonderful! Prodigious!' exclaimed the astonished old man. "'I will add that reflection has confirmed my suspicions. I ask myself why this man, instead of flying at once, should have waited and remained there, at that door, to parley with us.' With a bound, Father Absinthe sprang again to his feet. Why? he interrupted. Because he had accomplices, and he wished to give them time to escape. Ah, I understand it all now. A triumphant smile parted Lecoq's lips. That is what I said to myself, he replied, and now it is easy to verify my suspicions. There is snow outside, isn't there? It was not necessary to say any more. The elder officer seized the light, and followed by his companion, he hastened to the back door of the house, which opened into a small garden. In this sheltered enclosure the snow had not melted, and upon its white surface the dark stains of numerous footprints presented themselves. Without hesitation, Lecoq threw himself upon his knees in the snow. He rose again almost immediately. "'These indentations were not made by the men's feet,' said he. There have been women here. End of section three. Section four of Monsieur Lecoq, Part One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Margaret Espayat. Monsieur Lecoq by Emile Gaboriau, Part One, Section Four. Obstinate men of Father Absinthe's stamp, who were at first always inclined to differ from other people's opinions, are the very individuals who end in madly adopting them. When an idea has at last penetrated their empty brains, they twist and turn it, dwell upon it, and develop it until it exceeds the bounds of reason. Hence the police veteran, 
was now much more strongly convinced than his companion that the usually clever Gevrol had been mistaken, and accordingly he laughed the inspector to scorn. On hearing Lecoq affirm that women had taken part in the horrible scene at the Poivriere, his joy was extreme. "'A fine affair!' he exclaimed. "'An excellent case!' and suddenly recollecting a maxim that has been handed down from the time of Cicero, he added in sententious tones, "'Who holds the woman holds the cause.' Lecoq did not deign to reply. He was standing upon the threshold, leaning against the framework of the door, his hand pressed to his forehead as motionless as a statue. The discovery he had just made, and which so delighted Father Absinthe, filled him with consternation. It was the death of his hopes, the annihilation of the ingenious structure which his imagination had built upon the foundation of a single sentence. There was no longer any mystery, so celebrity was not to be gained by a brilliant stroke. For the presence of two women in this vile den explained everything in the most natural and commonplace fashion. Their presence explained the quarrel, the testimony of Widow Chupin, the dying declaration of the pretended soldier. The behavior of the murderer was also explained. He had remained to cover the retreat of the two women. He had sacrificed himself in order to save them, an act of gallantry so common in the French character that any scoundrel of the barrières might have performed it. Still, the strange allusion to the Battle of Waterloo remained unexplained. But what did that prove now? Nothing, simply nothing. However, who could say how low an unworthy passion might cause a man even of birth and breeding to descend? And the carnival afforded an opportunity for the parties to disguise themselves. But while Lecoq was turning and twisting all these probabilities in his mind, Father Absinthe became impatient. "'Are we going to remain here until doomsday?' he asked. "'Are we to pause just at the moment when our search has been productive of such brilliant results?' "'Brilliant results!' These words stung the young man as deeply as the keenest irony could have done. "'Leave me alone,' he replied gruffly. And above all, don't walk about the garden, as by doing so you'll damage any footprints. His companion swore a little, but soon became silent in his turn. He was constrained to submit to the irresistible ascendancy of superior will and intelligence. Lecoq was engaged in following out his course of reasoning. The murderer, leaving the ball at the Rainbow, a dancing house not far from here, near the fortifications, came to this wine-shop accompanied by two women. He found three men drinking here, who either began teasing him, or who displayed too much gallantry toward his companions. He became angry. The others threatened him. He was one against three. He was armed. He became wild with rage and fired. He checked himself, and an instant after added aloud, but was it the murderer who brought these women here? If he is tried, this will be the important point. It is necessary to obtain information regarding it. He immediately went back into the house, closely followed by his colleague, and began an examination of the footprints round about the door that Gevrol had forced open. Labor lost. There was but little snow on the ground near the entrance of the hovel, and so many persons had passed in and out that Lecoq could discover nothing. What a disappointment after his patient hopes! Lecoq could have cried with rage. He saw the opportunity for which he had sighed so long indefinitely postponed. He fancied he could hear Gevrol's coarse sarcasms. "'Enough of this,' he murmured under his breath. "'The general was right, and I am a fool.' He was so positively convinced that one could do no more than discover the circumstances of some commonplace, vulgar broil, that he began to wonder if it would not be wise to renounce his search and take a nap while awaiting the coming of the commissary of police. But Father Absinthe was no longer of this opinion. This worthy man, who was far from suspecting the nature of his companion's reflections, could not explain his inaction. "'Come, my boy,' said he. Have you lost your wits? This is losing time, it seems to me. 
The authorities will arrive in a few hours, and what report shall we be able to give them? As for me, if you desire to go to sleep, I shall pursue the investigation alone. Disappointed as he was, the young police officer could not repress a smile. He recognized his own exhortation of a few moments before. It was the old man who had suddenly become intrepid. To work, then, he sighed, like a man who, while foreseeing defeat, wishes at least to have no cause for self-reproach. He found it, however, extremely difficult to follow the footprints in the open air by the uncertain light of a candle, which was extinguished by the least breath of wind. "'I wonder if there's a lantern in the house,' he said. "'If we could only lay our hands upon one.' They searched everywhere, and, at last, upstairs in the widow Chupin's own room, they found a well-trimmed lantern, so small and compact, that it certainly had never been intended for honest purposes." "'A regular burglar's implement,' said Father Absinthe, with a coarse laugh. The implement was useful in any case, as both men agreed when they returned to the garden and recommenced their investigations systematically. They advanced very slowly and with extreme caution. The old man carefully held the lantern in the best position, while Lecoq, on his knees, studied each footprint with the attention of a chiromancer professing to read the future in the hand of a rich client. This new examination assured Lecoq that he had been correct in his first supposition. It was plain that two women had left the Poivriere by the back door. They had started off running, as was proved by the length of the steps and the shape of the footprints. The difference in the tracks left by the two fugitives was so remarkable that it did not escape Father Absinthe's eyes. Sapristi, he muttered, one of these jades can boast of having a pretty foot at the end of her leg. He was right. One of the tracks betrayed a small, coquettish, slender foot, clad in an elegant high-heeled boot with a narrow sole and an arched instep. The other denoted a broad, short foot growing wider toward the end. It had evidently been encased in a strong, low shoe. This was indeed a clue. Lecoq's hopes at once revived. So eagerly does a man welcome any supposition that is in accordance with his desires. Trembling with anxiety, he went to examine some other footprints a short distance from these, and an excited exclamation at once escaped his lips. "'What is it?' eagerly inquired the other agent. "'What do you see?' "'Come and look for yourself. See there!' cried Lecoq. The old man bent down, and his surprise was so great that he almost dropped the lantern. "'Oh!' he said in a stifled voice. "'A man's footprint!' "'Exactly! And this fellow wore the finest of boots. See that imprint? How clear, how neat it is!' Worthy Father Absinthe was scratching his ear furiously, his usual method of quickening his rather slow wits. "'But it seems to me,' he ventured to say at last, "'that this individual was not coming from this ill-fated hovel.' "'Of course not. The direction of the foot tells you that. No, he was not going away. He was coming here. But he did not pass beyond the spot where we are now standing. He was standing on tiptoe with outstretched neck and listening ears, when, on reaching this spot, he heard some noise. Fear seized him, and he fled.' or, rather, the women were going out as he was coming, and— No, the women were outside the garden when he entered it. This assertion seemed far too audacious to suit Lecoq's companion, who remarked, One cannot be sure of that. I am sure of it, however, and I can prove it conclusively. If you doubt it, it is because your eyes are growing old. Bring your lantern a little nearer. Yes, here it is. Our man placed his large foot upon one of the marks made by the woman with the small foot, and almost effaced it. This unexceptionable piece of circumstantial evidence stupefied the old police agent. Now, continued Lecoq, could this man have been the accomplice whom the murderer was expecting? Might it not have been some strolling vagrant whose attention was attracted by the two pistol shots? This is what we must ascertain, and we will ascertain it. Come. A wood fence of lattice-work, rather more than three feet high, was all that separated the widow Chupin's garden from the wasteland surrounding it. 
When Lecoq made the circuit of the house to cut off the murderer's escape, he had encountered this obstacle, and, fearing lest he should arrive too late, had leaped the fence to the great detriment of his pantaloons, without even asking himself if there was a gate or not. There was one, however, a light gate of lattice-work similar to the fence, turning upon iron hinges and closed by wooden button. Now it was straight toward this gate that these footprints in the snow led the two police agents. Some new thought must have struck the younger man, for he suddenly paused. Ah, he murmured, these two women did not come to the Poivriere this evening for the first time. Why do you think that, my boy? inquired Father Absinthe. I could almost swear it. How, unless they were in the habit of coming to this den, could they have been aware of the existence of this gate? Could they have discovered it on such a dark, foggy night? No, for I, who can, without boasting, say that I have good eyes, I did not see it. Ah, yes, that is true. These two women, however, came here without hesitating in a straight line, and note that to do this it was necessary for them to cross the garden diagonally. The veteran would have given something if he could have found some objection to offer, but unfortunately he could find none. Upon my word, he exclaimed, yours is a droll way of proceeding. You're only a conscript. I am a veteran in the service, and have assisted in more affairs than this sort than you are years old. But never have I seen— Nonsense, interrupted Lecoq. You will see much more. For example, I can prove to you that although the women knew the exact position of the gate, the man knew it only by hearsay. The proof. The fact is easily demonstrated. Study the man's footprints, and you who are very sharp will see at once that he deviated greatly from the straight course. He was in such doubt that he was obligated to search for the gate with his hands stretched out before him, and his fingers have left their imprint on the thin covering of snow that lies upon the upper railing of the fence. The old man would have been glad to verify this statement for himself, as he said, but Lecoq was in a hurry. Let us go on, let us go on, he said. You can verify my assertions some other time. They left the garden and followed the footprints which led them toward the outer boulevards, inclining somewhat in the direction of the Rue de Pâté. There was now no longer any need of close attention. No one save the fugitives had crossed this lonely waste since the last fall of snow. A child could have followed the track, so clear and distinct it was. Four series of footprints, very unlike in character, formed the track. Two of these had evidently been left by the women. The other two, one going and one returning, had been made by the man. On several occasions the latter had placed his foot exactly on the footprints left by the two women, half effacing them, thus dispelling all doubt as to the precise moment of his approach. About a hundred yards from the Poivriere, Lecoq suddenly seized his colleague's arm. Halt! he exclaimed. We have reached a good place. I can see unmistakable proofs. The spot, all unenclosed as it was, was evidently utilized by some builder for the storage of various kinds of lumber. The ground was strewn with large blocks of granite, some chiseled, some in the rough, with numerous long planks and logs of wood in their midst. In front of one of these logs, the surface of which had been evidently wiped, all the various footprints came together, mingling confusedly. Here, declared the young detective, our fugitives met the man and took counsel with him. One of the women, the one with the little feet, sat down upon this log. We ought to make sure of that, said Father Absinthe in an oracular tone. But his companion cut short his desire for verification. You, my old friend, said he, are going to do me the kindness to keep perfectly still. Pass me the lantern and do not move. Lecoq's modest tone had suddenly become so imperious that his colleague dared offer no resistance. Like a soldier at the command to halt, he remained erect, motionless and mute, following his colleague's movements with an inquisitive, wondering eye. Quick in his motions, and understanding how to maneuver the lantern in accordance with his wishes, the young police agent explored the surroundings in a very short space of time. A bloodhound in pursuit of his prey would have been less alert, less discerning, less agile. He came and went, now turning, now pausing, now retreating, 
now hurrying on again without any apparent reason. He scrutinized, he questioned every surrounding object, the ground, the logs of wood, the blocks of stone. In a word, nothing escaped his glance. For a moment he would remain standing, then fall upon his knees, and at times lie flat upon his stomach, with his face so near the ground that his breath must have melted the snow. He had drawn a tape-line from his pocket, and using it with a carpenter's dexterity, he measured, measured, and measured. And all his movements were accompanied with the wild gestures of a madman, interspersed with oaths or short laughs, with exclamations of disappointment or delight. After a quarter of an hour of this strange exercise, he turned to Father Absinthe, placed the lantern on a stone, wiped his hands with his pocket-handkerchief, and said, "'Now I know everything.' "'Well, that is saying a great deal.' "'When I say everything, I mean all that is connected with the episode of the drama which ended in the bloody bout in the hovel. This expanse of earth covered with snow is a white page upon which the people we are in search of have written not only their movements, their goings and comings, but also their secret thoughts, their alternate hopes and anxieties. What do these footprints say to you, Papa Absinthe? To me they are alive like the persons who made them. They breathe, speak, accuse. The old agent was saying to himself, Certainly this fellow is intelligent, undeniably shrewd, but he is very disagreeable. These are the facts as I have read them, pursued Lecoq. When the murderer repaired to the Poivriere with the two women, his companion, I should say his accomplice, came here to wait. He was a tall man of middle age. He wore a soft hat and a shaggy brown overcoat. He was, moreover, probably married, or had been so, as he had a wedding ring on the little finger of his right hand. His companion's despairing gestures obliged the speaker to pause. This description of a person whose existence had but just now been demonstrated, these precise details given in a tone of absolute certainty, completely upset all Father Absinthe's ideas, increasing his perplexity beyond all bounds. "'This is not right,' he growled. "'This is not kind. You are poking fun at me. I take the thing seriously. I listen to you, I obey you in everything, and then you mock me in this way.' We find a clue, and instead of following it up, you stop to relate all these absurd stories. No, replied his companion, I am not jesting, and I have told you nothing of which I am not absolutely sure, nothing that is not strictly and indisputably true. And you would have me believe? Fear nothing, Papa. I would not have you do violence to your convictions. When I have told you my reasons and my means of information, you will laugh at the simplicity of the theory that seems so incomprehensible to you now. "'Go on, then,' said the good man, in a tone of resignation. "'We had decided,' rejoined Lecoq, "'that the accomplice mounted guard here. The time seemed long, and, growing impatient, he paced to and fro the length of this log of wood, occasionally pausing to listen. Hearing nothing, he stamped his foot, doubtless exclaiming, What the deuce has happened to him down there? He had made about thirty turns, I have counted them, when a sound broke the stillness. The two women were coming. On hearing Lecoq's recital, all the conflicting sentiments that are awakened in a child's mind by a fairy tale, doubt, faith, anxiety, and hope, filled Father Absinthe's heart. What should he believe? What should he refuse to believe? he did not know. How was he to separate the true from the false among all these equally surprising assertions? On the other hand, the gravity of his companion, which certainly was not feigned, dismissed all idea of pleasantry. Finally, curiosity began to torture him. "'We had reached the point where the women made their appearance,' said he. "'Yes, indeed,' responded Lecoq. "'But here all certainty ceases. No more proofs, only suppositions.' Still, I have every reason to believe that our fugitives left the drinking den before the beginning of the fight, before the cries that attracted our attention. Who were they? I can only conjecture. I suspect, however, that they were not equals in rank. I am inclined to think that one was the mistress, the other her servant. 
"'That is proved,' ventured the old man, "'by the great difference in their feet and in their shoes.' This shrewd observation elicited a smile from Lecoq. "'That difference,' he replied seriously, "'is something, of course, "'but it was not that which decided me in my opinion. "'If greater or less perfection of the extremities "'regulated social distinctions, "'many mistresses would be servants. "'What struck me was this.' When the two women rushed wildly from Mother Chupin's house, the woman with the small feet sprang across the garden with one bound. She darted on some distance in advance of the other. The terror of the situation, the vileness of the den, the horror of the scandal, the thought of safety, inspired her with marvelous energy. But her strength, as often happens with delicate and nervous women, lasted only a few seconds. She was not halfway from the poivriere when her speed relaxed, her limbs trembled. Ten steps farther on she tottered and almost fell. Some steps farther, and she became so exhausted that she let go her hold upon her skirts. They trailed upon the snow, tracing a faint circle there. Then the woman with the broad feet came to aid her. She seized her companion round the waist, she dragged her along, their footprints are mingled confusedly. Then, seeing that her friend was about to fall, she caught her up in her strong arms and carried her, for you will see that the footprints made by the woman with the small feet suddenly cease at this point. Was Lecoq merely amusing himself by inventing this story? Was this scene anything but a work of imagination? Was the accent of deep and sincere conviction which he imparted to his words only feigned? Father Absinthe was still in doubt but he thought of a way in which he might satisfy his uncertainty. He caught up the lantern and hurried off to examine these footprints which he had not known how to read, which had been speechless to him, but which yielded their secret to another. He was obliged to agree with his companion. All that Lecoq had described was written there. He saw the confused footprints, the circle made by the sweeping skirts, the cessation of the tiny imprints. On his return, his countenance betrayed a respectful and astonished admiration, and it was with a shade of embarrassment that he said, "'You can scarcely blame an old man for being a little like St. Thomas. I have touched it with my fingers, and now I am content to follow you.' The young police agent could not, indeed, blame his colleague for his incredulity. Resuming his recital, he continued, then the accomplice, who had heard the fugitives coming, ran to meet them, and he aided the woman with the large feet in carrying her companion. The latter must have been really ill, for the accomplice took off his hat and used it in brushing the snow off this log. Then, thinking the surface was not yet dry enough, he wiped it with the skirt of his overcoat. Were these civilities pure gallantry, or the usual attentions of an inferior? I have asked myself that question. This much, however, is certain. While the woman with the small feet was recovering her strength, half reclining upon this board, the other took the accomplice a little on one side, five or six steps away to the left, just beside that enormous block of granite. There she talked with him, and, as he listened, the man leaned upon the snow-covered stone. His hand left a very distinct imprint there. Then, as the conversation continued, he rested his elbow upon the snowy surface. Like all men of limited intelligence, Father Absinthe had suddenly passed from unreasoning distrust to unquestioning confidence. Henceforth he could believe anything for the very same reason that had, at first, made him believe nothing. Having no idea of the bounds of human reasoning and penetration, he saw no limits to the conjectural genius of his companion. With perfect faith, therefore, he inquired, "'And what was the accomplice saying to the woman with the broad shoes?' Lecoq smiled at this simplicity, but the other did not see him do so. "'It is rather difficult for me to answer that question,' replied the young detective. "'I think, however, that the woman was explaining to the man the immensity and imminence of the danger that threatened his companion, and that they were trying to devise some means to rescue him from it. Perhaps she brought him orders given by the murderer. It is certain that she ended by beseeching the accomplice to run to the Poivriere and see what was passing there. 
and he did so, for his tracks start from this block of granite. "'And only to think,' exclaimed Father Absinthe, "'that we were in the hovel at that very moment. A word from Gevrol, and we might have had handcuffs on the whole gang. How unfortunate!' Lecoq was not sufficiently disinterested to share his companion's regret. On the contrary, he was very thankful for Gevrol's blunder. Had it not been for that, how would he ever have found an opportunity of investigating an affair that grew more and more mysterious as his search proceeded, but which he hoped to fathom finally? To conclude, he resumed, the accomplice soon returned, he had witnessed the scene, and was evidently afraid. He feared that the thought of exploring the premises might enter the minds of the police. It was to the lady with the small feet that he addressed himself. He explained the necessity of flight, and told her that even a moment's delay might be fatal. At his words she summoned all her energy. She rose and hastened away, clinging to the arm of her companion. Did the man indicate the route they were to take, or did they know it themselves? This much is certain, he accompanied them some distance, in order to watch over them. But, besides protecting these women, he had a still more sacred duty to perform, that of succoring his accomplice, if possible. He retraced his steps, passed by here once more, and the last footprint that I can discover leads in the direction of the Rue du Chateau de Rentier. He wished to know what would become of the murderer, and went to place himself where he might see him pass by with his captors. Like a dilettante who can scarcely restrain his applause until the close of the aria that delights him, Father Absinthe had been unable during the recital to entirely suppress his admiration. But it was not until Lecoq ceased speaking that he gave full vent to his enthusiasm. "'Here is a detective, if you like,' he exclaimed. "'And they pretend that Gevrol is shrewd. What has he ever done to compare with this? Ah, shall I tell you what I think? Why—' In comparison with you, the general is a more John the Baptist. Certainly the flattery was gross, but it was impossible to doubt its sincerity. This was the first time that the balmy dew of praise had fallen upon Lecoq's vanity, and it greatly delighted him, although he modestly replied, Nonsense! You are too kind, Papa. After all, what have I done that is so very clever? I told you that the man was of middle age. It was not difficult to see that after one had examined his heavy, dragging step. I told you that he was tall, an easy matter. When I saw that he had been leaning upon that block of granite there to the left, I measured the block in question. It is almost five feet five inches in height. Consequently, a man who could rest his elbow upon it must be at least six feet high. The mark of his hand proves that I am not mistaken." On seeing that he brushed away the snow which covered the plank, I asked myself what he had used. I thought that it might be his cap, and the mark left by the peak proves that I was right. Finally, if I have discovered the color and material of his overcoat, it's only because when he wiped the wet board, some splinters of the wood tore off a few tiny flakes of brown wool, which I have found, and which will figure in the trial. But what does this amount to, after all? Nothing. We have only discovered the first clues of the affair. Still, we are on the right scent. So, forward, then. The old officer was electrified, and, like an echo, he repeated, Forward. End of section 4All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Margaret Espaillat. Monsieur Lecoq by Émile Gaboriau. Part 1. Section 5. That night the vagabonds, who had taken refuge in the neighborhood of the Poivrière, had a very bad time of it. For, while those who managed to sleep were disturbed by frightful dreams of a police raid, those who remained awake witnessed some strange incidents, well calculated to fill their minds with terror. On hearing the shots fired inside Mother Chupin's drinking den, most of the vagrants concluded that there had been a collision between the police and some of their comrades, 
and they immediately began prowling about, eagerly listening and watching, and ready to take flight at the least sign of danger. At first they could discover no particular reasons for alarm, but later on at about two o'clock in the morning, just as they were beginning to feel secure again, the fog lifted a little, and they witnessed a phenomenon well calculated to arouse anxiety. Upon the unoccupied tract of land, which the people of the neighborhood called the plain, a small but very bright light was seen describing the most capricious evolutions. It moved here and there without any apparent aim, tracing the most inexplicable zigzags, sometimes sinking to the earth, sometimes rising to a height of four or five feet, at others remaining quite motionless, and the next second flying off like a ball. In spite of the place and season of the year, the less ignorant among vagabonds believed the light to be some ignis fatus, one of those luminous meteors that raise from the marshes and float about in the atmosphere at the bidding of the wind. In point of fact, however, this ignis fatus was the lantern by the light of which the two police agents were pursuing their investigations. After thus suddenly revealing his capacity to his first disciple, Lecoq found himself involved in a cruel perplexity. He had not the boldness and promptness of decision which is the gift of a prosperous past, and was hesitating between two courses, both equally reasonable, and both offering strong probabilities of success. He stood between two paths, that made by the two women on the one side, and that made by the accomplice on the other. Which should he take? For he could not hope to follow both. Seated upon the log where the women had rested a few moments before, with his hand pressed upon his forehead, he reflected and weighed the chances. If I follow the man, I shall learn nothing that I do not know already. He has gone to hover round the party. He has followed them at a distance. He has seen them lock up his accomplice, and he is undoubtedly prowling round about the station-house. If I hurried in pursuit, could I hope to overtake and capture him? No, too long a time has elapsed. Father Absinthe listened to this monologue with intense curiosity, as anxious as an unsophisticated person who, having questioned a clairvoyant in regard to some lost articles, is waiting the oracle's response. "'To follow the women,' continued the young man, "'to what would that lead? "'Perhaps to an important discovery. "'Perhaps to nothing.' "'However, he preferred the unknown, "'which, with all its chances of failure, "'had chances of success as well. "'He rose. "'His course was decided. "'Father Absinthe,' said he, "'we're going to follow the footprints of these two women, "'and wherever they lead us we will go.' Inspired with equal ardor, they began their walk. At the end of the path upon which they had entered, they fancied they observed, as in some magic glass, the one the fruits, the other the glory of success. They hurried forward. At first it was only play to follow the distinct footprints that led toward the Seine, but it was not long before they were obliged to proceed more slowly. On leaving the waste ground, they arrived at the outer limits of civilization, so to speak, and strange footprints mingled constantly with the footprints of the fugitives, at times even effacing them. In many spots, either on account of exposure or the nature of the soil, the thaw had completed its work, and there were large patches of ground entirely free from snow. In such cases they lost the trail, and it required all Lecoq's sagacity and all his companions' good will to find it again. On such occasions Father Absinthe planted his cane in the earth near the last footprint that had been discovered, and Lecoq and himself hunted all over the ground around this point, much after the fashion of a couple of bloodhounds thrown off the scent. Then it was that the lantern moved about so strangely. More than a dozen times, in spite of all their efforts, they would have lost the clue entirely had it not been for the elegant shoes worn by the lady with the little feet. These had such small and extremely high heels that the impression they left could not be mistaken. They sank down three or four inches in the snow or the mud, and their tell-tale impress remained as clear and distinct as that of a seal. 
Thanks to these heels, the pursuers were able to discover that the two fugitives had not gone up the Rue de Pâté, as might have been supposed. Probably they had considered this street too frequented and too well lighted. They had only crossed it, just below the Rue de la Croix Rouge, and had profited by an empty space between two houses to regain the open ground. "'Certainly these women were well acquainted with the locality,' murmured Lecoq. Indeed, the topography of the district evidently had no secrets for them, for, on quitting the Rue de Pâté, they had immediately turned to the right so as to avoid several large excavations from which a quantity of brick clay had been dug. But at last the trail was recovered, and the detectives followed it as far as the Rue de Chevalerie. Here the footprints abruptly ceased. Lecoq discovered eight or ten footmarks left by the woman who wore the broad shoes, but that was all. Hereabout, moreover, the condition of the ground was not calculated to facilitate an exploration of this nature. There had been a great deal of passing to and fro in the Rue de Chevalerie, and not merely was there scarcely any snow left on the footpaths, but the middle of the street was transformed into a river of slush. Did these people recollect, at last, that the snow might betray them? Did they take the middle of the road? grumbled the young police agent. Certainly they could not have crossed to a vacant space as they had done just before, for on the other side of the street extended a long factory wall. Ah! sighed Father Absinthe. We have our labor for our pains. But Lecoq possessed a temperament that refused to acknowledge defeat animated by the cold anger of a man who sees the object which he is about to seize disappear from before his eyes, he recommenced his search, and was well repaid for his efforts. "'I understand,' he cried suddenly. "'I comprehend. I see.' Father Absinthe drew near. He did not see nor divine anything, but he no longer doubted his companion's powers. "'Look there,' said Lecoq. "'What are those marks?' marks left by the wheels of some carriage that plainly turned here very well papa these tracks explain everything when they reached this spot our fugitives saw the light of an approaching cab which was returning from the centre of paris it was empty and proved their salvation they waited and when it came nearer they hailed the driver no doubt they promised him a handsome fare this is indeed evident since he consented to go back again he turned round here they got into the vehicle, and that's why the footprints go no further. This explanation did not please Lecoq's companion. "'Have we made any great progress now that we know that?' he asked. Lecoq could not restrain an impulse to shrug his shoulders. "'Did you expect that the tracks made by the fugitives would lead us through Paris and up to their very doors?' he asked. "'No, but—' "'Then what would you ask more? Do you think that I shall not know how to find this driver to-morrow?' He was returning with his empty vehicle, his day's work was ended, hence his stable is in the neighborhood. Do you suppose that he will have forgotten that he took up two persons in the Rue de Chevalerie? He will tell us where he drove them, but that will not do us any good, for, of course, they will not have given them their real address. But, at all events, he can probably give us a description of them, tell us how they were dressed, describe their appearance, their manner, and their age. And with that, and what we already know, an eloquent gesture expressed the remainder of his thought. Then he added, We must now go back to the Poivriere, and go quickly. And you, my friend, may now extinguish your lantern. End of section 5this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Margaret S. Bayat. Monsieur Lecoq by Émile Gaboriau, Part One, Section Six. While doing his best to keep pace with his companion, who was in such haste to get back to the Poivriere that he almost ran, Father Absinthe's thoughts were as busy as his legs and an entirely new train of ideas was awakened in his mind. During the twenty-five years that he had been connected with the police force, 
the good man to use his own expression had seen many of his colleagues walk over him and win after only a few months work a promotion that his long years of service had not gained for him in these cases he had not failed to accuse his superiors of injustice and his fortunate rivals of gross flattery in his opinion seniority was the only claim to advancement the only the best the most respectable claim and he was wont to sum up all his opinions all his grief and bitterness of mind in one phrase it is infamous to pass over an old member of the service to-night however father absinthe discovered that there is something else in the world besides seniority and sufficient reasons for what he had formerly regarded as favoritism he secretly confessed that this newcomer whom he had treated so carelessly had just followed up a clue as he veteran though he was would never have succeeded in doing but communing with himself was not this good man's fort he soon grew weary of reflection and on reaching a place where they were obliged to proceed more slowly on account of the badness of the road he deemed it a favorable opportunity to resume the conversation you are silent comrade he ventured to remark and one might swear that you were not exactly pleased this surprising result of the old man's reflections would have amazed lecoq if his mind had not been a hundred leagues away no i'm not pleased he responded and why pray only ten minutes ago you were as gay as a lark then i did not see the misfortune that threatens us a misfortune a very great misfortune do you not perceive that the weather has undesirably changed it is evident that the wind is now coming from the south the fog has disappeared but the sky is cloudy and threatening it will rain in less than an hour a few drops are falling now i just felt one these words produced on lecoq much the same effect as a whip-up on a spirited horse he sprang forward and adopting a still more hurried pace exclaimed let us make haste let us make haste the old police agent followed him as in duty bound but his mind was if possible still more troubled by the replies of his young companion a great misfortune the wind from the south rain he did not he could not see the connection greatly puzzled and not a little anxious father absinthe asked for an explanation although he had but little more breath than was absolutely necessary to enable him to continue the forced march he was making upon my word said he i have racked my brains his companion took pity on his anxiety what he exclaimed as he hastened still forward you do not understand that our investigation my success and your reward are dependent upon those black clouds which the wind is driving toward us oh twenty minutes of merely gentle rain and our time and labor will be lost if it rains the snow will melt and then farewell to our proofs let us get on let us get on more quickly you know very well that in such cases words don't suffice but if we declare to the public prosecutor that we have seen these footprints he will ask where and what can we say if we swear by all the gods that we have seen the footprints of a man and of two women the investigating magistrate will say let me see them and who will feel sheepish then father absinthe and lecoq besides gevrol would not fail to declare that we were saying what was not true in order to enhance our own value and humiliate him what an idea faster papa faster you will have all day to-morrow to be indignant perhaps it will not rain in that case these perfect clear and easily recognizable footprints will prove the culprit's ruin how can we preserve them by what process could we solidify them i would deluge them with my blood if that could only cause them to congeal father absinthe was just then thinking that his share of the labor had hitherto been the least important for he had merely held the lantern but here was a chance for him to acquire a real and substantial right to the prospective reward i know a method said he by which one could preserve these marks in the snow at these words the younger man stopped short you know you he interrupted yes i know replied the old detective 
with the evident satisfaction of a man who has gained his revenge. They invented a way at the time of that affair at the Maison Blanche last December. I recollect. Ah, well, on the snow in the courtyard there was a footprint that attracted a detective's attention. He said that the whole evidence depended on that mark alone, and that it was worth more than ten years' hard work in following up the case. Naturally, he desired to preserve it. They sent for a great chemist. Go on, go on. I have never seen the method put into practice, but an expert told me all about it, and showed me the mold they obtained. He explained it to me precisely on account of my profession. Lecoq was trembling with impatience. And how did they obtain the mold? he asked abruptly. Wait, I was just going to explain. They take some of the best gelatin and allow it to soak in cold water. When it becomes thoroughly softened, they heat it until it forms a liquid of moderate consistency. Then, when it is just cool enough, they pour a nice little covering of it upon the footprint. Lecoq felt the irritation that is natural to a person who has just heard a bad joke, or who has lost his time in listening to a fool. "'Enough!' he interrupted angrily. "'That method can be found in all the manuals. It is excellent, no doubt, but how can it serve us? Have you any gelatin about you?' "'No.' "'Nor have I. You might as well have counseled me to pour melted lead upon the footprints to fix them.' They continued their way, and five minutes later, without having exchanged another word, they re-entered the widow Chupin's hovel. The first impulse of the older man would have been to rest to breathe, but Lecoq did not give him time to do so. "'Make haste! Get me a dish, a plate, anything!' cried the young detective. "'And bring me some water. Gather together all the boards and old boxes you can find lying about.' While his companion was obeying him, Lecoq armed himself with a fragment of one of the broken bottles, and began scraping away furiously at the plastered wall that separated the two rooms. His mind, disconcerted at first by the imminence of this unexpected catastrophe, a fall of rain, had now regained its equilibrium. He had reflected, he had thought of a way by which failure might possibly be averted, and he hoped for ultimate success. When he had accumulated some seven or eight handfuls of fine plaster dust, he mixed one half with a little water so as to form a thin paste, leaving the rest untouched on the side of the plate. "'Now, Papa,' said he, "'come and hold the light for me.' When in the garden, the young man sought for the deepest and most distinct of the footprints, knelt beside it, and began his experiment, trembling with anxiety. He first sprinkled upon the impression a fine coating of dry plaster, and then upon this coating, with infinite care, he poured his liquid solution drop by drop. What luck! The experiment was successful. The plaster united in a homogeneous mass, forming a perfect model of the impression. Thus, after an hour's labor, Lecoq possessed a half a dozen of these casts, which might, perhaps, be a little wanting in clearness of outline, but which were quite perfect enough to be used as evidence. The young detective's alarm had been well founded, for it was already beginning to rain. Still, he had plenty of time to cover a number of the footprints with the boxes and pieces of board which Father Absinthe had collected, thus placing them, as it were, beyond the reach of a thaw. Now he could breathe. The authorities might come, for the most important part of his task was completed. End of section 6《セクション7 of Monsieur Le Coq, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nadine Eckert Boulet. Monsieur Le Coq by Emile Gaboriau, Part 1, Section 7. Chapter 5. It was some distance from the Poivriere to the Rue de Chevaleret. Even by way of the plain, and fully four hours had been occupied by Lecoq and his colleague in collecting their elements of information. All this while, the widow Chupin's abode had remained open, accessible to any chance visitor. Still, when, on his return, 
the young police agent remembered this neglect of elementary precautions, he did not feel alarmed. Considering all the circumstances, it was very difficult to believe that any serious harm could have resulted from this carelessness. For who would have been likely to visit this drinking den after midnight? Its bad name served the purpose of a bulwark. The most daring vagrants did not drink there without some disquietude, fearing that if the liquor caused them to lose consciousness, they might be rubbed or perhaps even murdered. Hence, if any one had been attracted to this notoriously dangerous drinking shop by the light that streamed through the open door, it could only have been some very reckless person returning late at night from the bull at the rainbow with a few sous left in his pocket. But, even then, a single glance inside would have sufficed to put the bravest to flight. In less than a second, the young police agent had waived all these possibilities concerning which he did not breathe a word to Father Absinthe. When, little by little, the excitement caused by his successive hopes and disappointments, and by the accomplishment of the experiment with the footprints had died away, and he had regained his usual calm of mind, he made a careful inspection of the abode, and was by no means satisfied with himself. He had experimented upon Father Absinthe with his new system of investigation, just as an aspiring orator tries his powers before his least gifted friends, not before the cleverest. He had certainly overwhelmed the old veteran by his superiority. He had literally crushed him. But what great merit, what wonderful victory was this! Why should he boast of having outwitted Father Absinthe? one of the least sagacious men in the service. If he could only have given some startling proofs of his energy or of his penetration. But, after all, what had he accomplished? Was the mystery solved? Was his success more than problematical? When one thread is drawn out, the skein is not entangled. This night would undoubtedly decide his future as a detective, so he swore that if he could not conquer his vanity, he would, at least, compel himself to conceal it. Hence, it was in a very modest tone that he said to his companion, We have done all that we can do outside. Now, would it not be wise to busy ourselves with the inside of the house? Everything looked exactly in the same state as when the two men left the room. A candle with a charred smoking wick cast its flickering light upon the same scene of disorder, revealing to view the rigid features of the three victims. Without losing a moment, Lecoq began to pick up and study the various objects scattered over the floor. Some of these still remained intact. The widow Chupin had recoiled from the expanse of a tiled floor, judging the bare ground upon which the cabin was built quite good enough for the feet of her customers. This ground, which must originally have been well beaten down, had, by constant use and damp, become well-nigh as muddy as the soil outside. The first fruits of Lecoq's search were a large salad bowl and a big iron spoon, the latter so twisted and bent that it had evidently been used as a weapon during the conflict. On inspecting the bowl, it became evident that when the quarrel began, the victims were regaling themselves with a familiar mixture of water, wine, and sugar, known round about the barriers as vin à la française. After the salad bowl, the two men picked up five of the weighty glasses ordinarily used in wine shops, and which, while looking as though they would contain half a bottle, are in point of fact so thick at the bottom that they hold next to nothing. Three of these glasses were broken, two were whole. All of them had contained wine, the same vin à la française. This was plain, but for greater shorty, Lecoq applied his tongue to the bluish mixture remaining in the bottom of each glass. The deuce, he muttered, with an astonished air. Then he examined successively the surfaces of the three overturned tables. Upon one of these, the one nearest the fireplace and the window, the still wet marks of the five glasses, of the salad bowl, and even of the spoons, could be distinguished. 
Lecoq very properly regarded this circumstance as a matter of the greatest importance, for it proved clearly enough that five persons had emptied the salad bowl in company. Who were these five persons? Ho, oh, oh, ho! suddenly exclaimed Lecoq, in two entirely different tones. Then the two women could not have been with the murderer. A very simple mood of discovery had presented itself to his mind. It was to ascertain if there were any other glasses, and what they had contained. After a fresh search on the floor, a sixth glass was found, similar in form to the others, but much smaller. Its smell showed that it had contained brandy. Then these two women had not been with the murderer, and therefore he could not have fought because the other men had insulted them. This discovery proved the inaccuracy of Lecoq's original suppositions. It was an unexpected check, and he was mourning over it in silence, when Father Absinthe, who had not ceased ferreting about, uttered a cry of surprise. The young man turned. He saw that his companion had become very pale. "'What is it?' he asked. "'Someone has been here in our absence.' "'Impossible!' It was not impossible. It was true. When Gevrol had torn the apron off Widow Chupin's head, he had thrown it upon the steps of the stairs. Neither of the police agents had since touched it. And yet the pockets of this apron were now turned inside out. This was a proof. This was evidence. At this discovery, Lecoq was overcome with consternation, and the contraction of his features revealed the struggle going on in his mind. "'Who could have been here?' he murmured. Rubbers? That is improbable. Then, after a long silence which his companion took good care not to interrupt, he added, The person who came here, who dared to penetrate into this abode and face the corpses of these murdered men, this person could have been none other than the accomplice. But it is not enough to suspect this. It is necessary to know it. I must, I will know it. They searched for a long time, and it was not until after an hour of earnest work that, in front of the door forced open by the police, they discovered in the mud, just inside the marks made by Gevrol's tread, a footprint that bore a close resemblance to those left by the man who had entered the garden. They compared the impressions and recognized the same designs formed by the nails upon the sole of the boot. "'It must have been the accomplice!' exclaimed Lecoq. He watched us, he saw us go away, and then he entered. But why? What pressing, irresistible necessity made him decide to brave such imminent danger? He seized his companion's hand, nearly crushing it in his excitement. Ah, I know why, continued he, violently. I understand only too well. Some article that would have served to throw light on this horrible affair had been left or forgotten, or lost here, and to obtain it, to find it, he decided to run this terrible risk. And to think that it was my fault, my fault alone, that this convincing proof escaped us. And I thought myself so shrewd. What a lesson! The door should have been locked. Any fool would have thought of it. Here he checked himself, and remained with open mouth and distended eyes, pointing with his finger to one of the corners of the room. "'What is the matter?' asked his frightened companion. Lecoq made no reply, but slowly, and with the stiff movements of a somnambulist, he approached the spot to which he had pointed, stooped, picked up something, and said, "'My folly is not deserving of such luck!' The object he had found was an earring composed of a single large diamond. The setting was of marvellous workmanship." This diamond, declared Lecoq, after a moment's examination, must be worth at least five or six thousand francs. Are you in earnest? I think I could swear to it. He would not have troubled about such a preamble as, I think, a few hours before, but the blunder he had made was a lesson that would not be forgotten so long as he lived. Perhaps it was that same diamond earring that the accomplice came to seek, ventured Father Absinthe. The supposition is scarcely admissible. 
In that case, he would not have sought for it in Mother Chupin's apron. No, he must have been seeking for something else. A letter, for example. The older man was not listening. He had taken the earring and was examining it in his turn. And to think, he murmured, astonished by the brilliancy of the stone, to think that a woman who had ten thousand francs worth of jewels in her ears would have come to the Poivriere. Who would have believed it? Lecoq shook his head thoughtfully. Yes, it is very strange, very improbable, very absurd. And yet we shall see many things quite as strange if we ever arrive, which I very much doubt, at a solution of this mysterious affair. End of section 7《セクション8 of Monsieur Le Coq, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nadine Cardboulet. Monsieur Le Coq by Emile Gaboriau, Part 1, Section 8. Day was breaking, cold, cheerless, and gloomy, when Le Coq and his colleague. Concluded their investigation. There was not an inch of space that had not been explored, carefully examined and studied, one might almost say, with a magnifying glass. There now only remained to draw up the report. The younger man seated himself at the table, and, with the view of making his recital as intelligible as possible, he began by sketching a plan of the scene of the murder. It will be seen that in the memoranda appended to this explanatory diagram, Lecoq had not once written his own name. In noting the things that he had imagined or discovered, he referred to himself simply as one of the police. This was not so much modesty as calculation. By hiding oneself on well chosen occasions, one gains greater notoriety when one emerges from the shade. It was also through cunning that he gave Gevrol such a prominent position. These tactics, rather subtle, perhaps, but after all perfectly fair, could not fail to call attention to the man who had shown himself so efficient when the efforts of his chief had been merely confined to breaking open the door. The document Lecoq drew up was not a procès verbal, a formal act reserved for the officers. Of judiciary police. It was a simple report that would be admitted under the title of an inquiry, and yet the young detective composed it with quite as much care as a general would have displayed in drawing up the bulletin of his first victory. While Lecoq was drawing and writing, Father Absinthe leaned over his shoulder to watch him. The plan amazed that worthy man. He had seen a great deal. But he had always supposed that it was necessary to be an engineer, an architect, or, at least, a carpenter, to execute such work. Not at all. With a tape line with which to take some measurements, and a bit of board in place of a rule, his inexperienced colleague had soon accomplished the miracle. Father Absinthe's respect for Lecoq was thereby greatly augmented. It is true that the worthy veteran, Had not noticed the explosion of the young police agent's vanity, nor his return to his former modest demeanour. He had not observed his alarm, nor his perplexity, nor his lack of penetration. After a few moments, Father Absinthe ceased watching his companion. He felt weary after the labours of the night, his head was burning, and he shivered and his knees trembled. Perhaps, though he was by no means sensitive, He felt the influence of the horrors that surrounded him, and which seemed more sinister than ever in the bleak light of morning. He began to ferret in the cupboards, and at last succeeded in discovering, oh, marvellous fortune, a bottle of brandy, three parts full. He hesitated for an instant, then he poured out a glass and drained it at a single draught. Will you have some? he inquired of his companion. It is not a very famous brand, to be sure, but it is just as good. It makes one's blood circulate and enlivens one. 
Lecoq refused. He did not need to be enlivened. All his faculties were hard at work. He intended that, after a single perusal of his report, the investigating magistrate should say, Let the officer who drew up this document be sent for. It must be remembered that Lecoq's future depended upon such an order. Accordingly, he took particular care to be brief, clear, and concise, to plainly indicate how his suspicions on the subject of the murder had been aroused, how they had increased, and how they had been confirmed. He explained by what series of deductions he had succeeded in establishing a theory which, if it was not the truth, was at least plausible enough to serve as the basis for further investigation. Then he enumerated the articles of conviction ranged on the table before him. There were the flakes of brown wool collected upon the plank, the valuable earring, the models of the different footprints in the garden, and the widow Chupin's apron, with its pockets turned inside out. There was also the murderer's revolver, with two barrels discharged and three still loaded. This weapon, although not of an ornamental character, was still a specimen of highly finished workmanship. It bore the name of one Stevens, 14 Skinner Street, a well-known London gunsmith. Lecoq felt convinced that by examining the bodies of the victims he would obtain other and perhaps very valuable information, but he did not dare venture upon such a course. Besides his own inexperience in such a matter, there was Gevrol to be thought of, and the inspector, furious at his own mistake, would not fail to declare that, by changing the attitude of the bodies, Lecoq had rendered a satisfactory examination by the physicians impossible. The young detective accordingly tried to console himself for his forced inaction in this respect, and he was re-reading his report, modifying a few expressions, when Father Absinthe, who was standing upon the threshold of the outer door, called to him. "'Is there anything new?' asked Lecoq. "'Yes,' was the reply. Here come Gevrol and two of our comrades, with the commissary of police, and two other gentlemen. It was, indeed, the commissary who was approaching, interested but not disturbed by this triple murder, which was sure to make his arrondissement the subject of Parisian conversation during the next few days. Why, indeed, should he be troubled about it? For Gevrol, whose opinion in such matters might be regarded as an authority, had taken care to reassure him when he went to arouse him from his slumbers. It was only a fight between some old offenders, former jailbirds, habitués of the poivrière, he had said, adding sententiously, if all these ruffians would kill one another, we might have some little peace. He added that as the murderer had been arrested and placed in confinement, there was nothing urgent about the case. Accordingly, the commissary thought there was no harm in taking another nap and waiting until morning before beginning the inquiry. He had seen the murderer, reported the case to the prefecture, and now he was coming, leisurely enough, accompanied by two physicians, appointed by the authorities to draw up a medico-legal report in all such cases. The party also comprised a sergeant major of the 53rd Regiment of Infantry of the Line, who had been summoned by the commissary to identify, if possible, the murdered man who wore a uniform, for if one might believe the number engraved upon the buttons of his overcoat, he belonged to the 53rd Regiment, now stationed at the neighboring fort. As the party approached, it was evident that Inspector Gevrol was even less disturbed than the commissary. He whistled as he walked along, flourishing his cane, which never left his hand, and already laughing in his sleeve over the discomfiture of the presumptuous fool who had desired to remain to glean where he, the experienced and skilful officer, had perceived nothing. As soon as he was within speaking distance, the inspector called to Father Absinthe, who, after warning Lecoq, remained on the threshold, leaning against the doorpost, puffing his pipe, as immovable as a sphinx. "'Ah, well, old man,' cried Gevrol, 
have you any great melodrama very dark and very mysterious to relate to us i have nothing to relate myself replied the old detective without even drawing his pipe from his lips i am too stupid that is perfectly understood but m lecoq will tell you something that will astonish you the prefix monsieur which the old police agent used in speaking of his colleague displeased gevrol so much that he pretended not to understand who are you speaking of he asked abruptly of my colleague of course who is now busy finishing his report of m lecoq quite unintentionally the worthy fellow had certainly become the young police agent's godfather from that day forward for his enemies as well as for his friends he was and he remained monsieur lecoq ha ha said the inspector whose hearing was evidently impaired ha he has discovered the pot of roses which others did not send general by this remark father absinthe made an enemy of his superior officer but he cared little for that lecoq had become his deity and no matter what the future might reserve the old veteran had resolved to follow his young colleague's fortunes we'll see about that murmured the inspector mentally resolving to have an eye on this youth whom success might transform into a rival he said no more for the little party which he preceded had now overtaken him and he stood aside to make way for the commissary of police this commissary was far from being a novice he had served for many years and yet he could not repress a gesture of horror as he entered the poivriere the sergeant-major of the fifty-third who followed him an old soldier decorated and medalled who had smelt powder many scores of times was still more overcome he grew as pale as the corpses lying on the ground and was obliged to lean against the wall for support the two physicians alone retained their stoical indifference lecoq had risen his report in his hand he bowed and assuming a respectful attitude was waiting to be questioned you must have passed a frightful night said the commissary kindly and quite unnecessarily since any investigation was superfluous i think however replied the young police agent having recourse to all his diplomacy that my time has not been entirely lost i have acted according to the instructions of my superior officer i have searched the premises thoroughly and i have ascertained many things i have for example acquired the certainty that the murderer had a friend possibly an accomplice of whom i can give quite a close description he must have been of middle age and wore if i am not mistaken a soft cap and a brown woolen overcoat as for his boots zounds exclaimed gevrol and i he stopped short like a man whose impulse had exceeded his discretion and who would have gladly recalled his words and you inquired the commissary pray what do you mean the inspector had gone too far to draw back and unwillingly was now obliged to act as his own executioner i was about to mention he said that this morning an hour or so ago while i was waiting for you sir before the station-house at the barriere d'italie where the murderer is confined i noticed close by an individual whose appearance was not unlike that of the man described by lecoq this man seemed to be very intoxicated for he reeled and staggered against the walls he tried to cross the street but fell down in the middle of it in such a position that he would inevitably have been crushed by the first passing vehicle lecoq turned away his head he did not wish them to read in his eyes how perfectly he understood the whole game. Seeing this, pursued Gevrol, I called two men and asked them to aid me in raising the poor devil. We went up to him. He had apparently fallen asleep. We shook him. We made him sit up. We told him that he could not remain there. But he immediately flew into a furious rage. He swore at us, threatened us, and began fighting us and on my word we had to take him to the station-house and leave him there to recover from the effects of his drunken debauch did you shut him up in the same cell with the murderer inquired lecoq naturally 
You know very well that there are only two cages in the station house at the barrière, one for men and the other for women. Consequently, the commissary seemed thoughtful. Ah, that's very unfortunate, he stammered, and there is no remedy. Excuse me, there is one, observed Gevrol. I can send one of my men to the station house with an order to detain the drunken man. Lecoq interposed with a gesture. Trouble lost, he said coldly. If this individual is an accomplice, he has got sober by now, rest assured of that, and is already far away. Then what is to be done? asked the inspector, with an ironical air. May one be permitted to ask the advice of Monsieur Lecoq? I think chance offered us a splendid opportunity, and we did not know how to seize it, and that the best thing we can do now is to give over mourning, and prepare to profit by the next opportunity that presents itself. Gevrol was, however, determined to send one of his men to the station-house, and it was not until the messenger had started that Lecoq commenced the reading of his report. He read it rapidly, refraining as much as possible from placing the decisive proofs in strong relief, reserving these for his own benefit. But so strong was the logic of his deductions, that he was frequently interrupted by approving remarks from the commissary and the two physicians. Gevrol, who alone represented the opposition, shrugged his shoulders till they were well-nigh dislocated, and grew literally green with jealousy. I think that you alone, young man, have judged correctly in this affair, said the commissary when Lecoq had finished reading. I may be mistaken, but your explanations have made me alter my opinion concerning the murderer's attitude while I was questioning him, which was only for a moment. He refused, obstinately refused, to answer my questions, and wouldn't even give me his name. The commissary was silent for a moment reviewing the past circumstances in his mind, and it was in a serious tone that he eventually added, We are, I feel convinced, in presence of one of those mysterious crimes, the causes of which are beyond the reach of human sagacity. This strikes me as being one of those enigmatical cases which human justice never can reach. Lecoq made no audible rejoinder, but he smiled to himself and thought, we will see about that. End of section 8。section 9 of Monsieur Lecoq, part 1。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org。Monsieur Lecoq by Emile Gaborio。part 1 。section 9 。Chapter 6. No consultation held at the bedside of a dying man ever took place in the presence of two physicians so utterly unlike each other as those who accompanied the commissary of police to the Poivriere. One of them, a tall old man with a bald head, wearing a broad-brimmed hat and an overcoat of antique cut, was evidently one of those modest savants encountered occasionally in the byways of Paris one of those healers devoted to their art, who too often die in obscurity, after rendering immense services to mankind. He had the gracious calmness of a man who, having seen so much of human misery, has nothing left to learn, and no troubled conscience could have possibly sustained his searching glance, which was as keen as his lancet. His colleague, young, fresh-looking, light-haired, and jovial, was somewhat foppishly attired, and his white hands were encased in handsome fur gloves. There was a soft, self-satisfied smile on his face, and he had the manners of those practitioners who, for profit's sake, invariably recommend the infallible panaceas invented each month in chemical laboratories, and advertised ad nauseam in the back pages of newspapers. He had probably written more than one article upon medicine for the use of the people, puffing various mixtures, pills, ointments, and plasters for the benefit of their respective inventors. "'I will request you, gentlemen,' said the commissary of police, "'to begin your duties by examining the victim who wears a military costume. Here is a sergeant-major summoned to answer a question of identity, whom I must send back to his quarters as soon as possible.' 
The two physicians responded with a gesture of assent, and, aided by Father Absinthe and another agent of police, they lifted the body and laid it upon two tables which had previously been placed end to end. They were not obliged to make any note of the attitude in which they found the body, since the unfortunate man, who was still alive when the police entered the cabin, had been moved before he expired. "'Approach, sergeant,' ordered the commissary, "'and look carefully at this man.' It was with very evident repugnance that the old soldier obeyed. "'What is the uniform that he wears?' "'It's the uniform of the 2nd Battalion of the 53rd Regiment of the Line.' "'Do you recognise him?' "'Not at all.' "'Are you sure that he does not belong to your regiment?' "'I cannot say for certain. There are some conscripts at the depot whom I have never seen. But— I am ready to swear that he had never formed part of the second battalion, which, by the way, is mine, and in which I am sergeant-major." Lecoq, who had hitherto remained in the background, now stepped forward. "'It might be as well,' he suggested, "'to note the numbers marked on the other articles of clothing.' "'That's a very good idea,' said the commissary approvingly. Uh, "'Here's his shako,' added the young police agent. "'It bears the number three thousand one hundred and twenty-nine.' The officials followed Lecoq's advice, and soon discovered that each article of clothing worn by the unfortunate man bore a different number. "'The deuce!' murmured the sergeant. "'There is every indication. But it is very singular.' Invited to consider what he was going to say, the brave trooper evidently made an effort to collect his intellectual faculties. "'I would stake my epaulettes that this fellow never was a soldier,' he said at last. "'He must have disguised himself to take part in the Shrove Sunday Carnival.' "'Why do you think that?' "'Oh, I know it better than I can explain it. I know it by his hair, by his nails, by his whole appearance, by certain je ne sais quoi. In short, I know it by everything and by nothing. Why, look! The poor devil didn't even know how to put on his shoes. He's, he's laced his gaiters wrong side outwards." Evidently further doubt was impossible after this evidence, which confirmed the truth of Lecoq's first remark to Inspector Gevrol. "'Still, if this person was a civilian, how could he have procured this clothing?' insisted the commissary. "'Could he have borrowed it from the men in your company?' "'Oh, yes, that is possible, but it's difficult to believe.' "'Is there no way by which you could ascertain?' "'Oh, very easily. I have only to run over at the fort and order an inspection of clothing.' "'Do so,' approved the commissary. "'It would be an excellent way of getting at the truth.' But Lecoq had thought of a method quite as convincing and much more prompt. "'One word, sergeant,' said he. "'Isn't cast-off military clothing sold by public auction?' "'Yes, at least once a year after the inspection.' "'And—' Are not the articles thus sold marked in some way? Assuredly. Then see if there isn't some mark of the kind on this poor wretch's uniform. The sergeant turned up the collar of the coat and examined the waistband of the pantaloons. You're right, he said. These are condemned garments. The eyes of the young police agent sparkled. We must then believe that the poor devil purchased this costume, he observed. Where? necessarily at the temple from one of the dealers in military clothing. There are only five or six of these establishments. I will go from one to another of them, and the person who sold these clothes will certainly recognize them by some trademark. And that will assist us very much, growled Gevrol. The sergeant-major, to his great relief, now received permission to retire, but not without having been warned that very probably the commissary would require his deposition. The moment had come to search the garments of the pretended soldier, and the commissary, who performed this duty himself, hoped that some clue as to the man's identity would be forthcoming. He proceeded with his task, at the same time dictating to one of the men a procès verbal of the search, that is to say, a minute description of all the articles he found upon the dead man's person. In the right hand trousers pocket some tobacco, a pipe, and a few matches were found, in the left hand one a linen handkerchief of good quality but unmarked, and a soiled leather pocket-book containing seven francs and sixty centimes. 
There appeared to be nothing more, and the commissary was expressing his regret, when, on carefully examining the pocket-book, he found a compartment which had at first escaped his notice, being hidden by a leather flap. This compartment contained a carefully folded paper. The commissary unfolded it, and read the contents aloud. "'My dear Gustave, to-morrow, Sunday evening, do not fail to come to the ball at the Rainbow according to our agreement. If you have no money, pass by my house, and I will leave some with the concierge who will give it to you. Be at the ball by eight o'clock. If I am not already there, it will not be long before I make my appearance. Everything is going on satisfactorily. La Chineur. Alas! What did this letter reveal? Only that the dead man's name was Gustave, that he had some connection with a man named Lacheneur, who had advanced him money for a certain object, and that they had met at the Rainbow some hours before the murder. It was little, very little, but still it was something, it was a clue, and in this absolute darkness even the faintest gleam of light was eagerly welcomed. Lacheneur, growled Gavrol. The poor devil uttered that name in his last agony. Precisely, insisted Father Absinthe, and he declared that he wished to revenge himself upon him. He accused him of having drawn him into a trap. Unfortunately, death cut his story short. Lecoq was silent. The commissary of police had handed him the letter, and he was studying it with the closest attention. The paper on which it was written was of the ordinary kind, the ink was blue. In one of the corners was a half-effaced stamp, of which one could just distinguish the word Beaumarchais. This was enough for Lecoq. This letter, he thought, was certainly written in a café on the boulevard Beaumarchais, in which one I must ascertain that point, for this lacaneur must be found. While the agents of the prefecture were gathered around the commissary, holding counsel and deliberating, the physicians began their delicate and disagreeable task. With the assistance of Father Absinthe they removed the clothing of the pretended soldier, and then, with sleeves rolled up, they bent over their subject, like surgeons in the schools of anatomy, and examined, inspected, and appraised him physically. Very willingly would the younger doctor have dispensed with these formalities, which he considered very ridiculous and entirely unnecessary, but the old physician had too high a regard for his profession, and for the duty he had been called upon to fulfil, to neglect the slightest detail. Minutely, and with the most scrupulous exactitude, he noted the height of the dead man, his supposed age, the nature of his temperament, the colour and length of his hair, and the degree of development of his muscular system. Then the doctors passed to an examination of the wound. Lecoq had judged correctly. The medical men declared it to be a fracture of the base of the skull. It could, they stated, only have been caused by some instrument with a very broad surface, or by a violent knock of the head against some hard substance of considerable magnitude. But no weapon other than the revolver had been found, and it was evidently not heavy enough to produce such a wound. There must, then, necessarily have been a hand-to-hand -hand struggle between the pretended soldier and the murderer, and the latter, seizing his adversary by the throat, had dashed him violently against the wall. The presence of some very tiny but very numerous spots of extravasated blood about the neck made this theory extremely plausible. No wound, not even a bruise or a scratch, was to be found. Hence it became evident that this terrible struggle must have been exceedingly short. The murder of the pretended soldier must have been consummated between the moment when the squad of police heard the shrieks of despair, and the moment when Lecoq peered through the shutter and saw the victim fall. The examination of the other murdered man required different but even greater precautions than those adopted by the doctors in their inspection of the pseudo-soldier. The position of these two victims had been respected, they were still lying across the hearth as they had fallen, and their attitude was a matter of great importance, since it might have decisive bearing on the case. Now this attitude was such that one could not fail to be impressed with the idea that, with both these men, death had been instantaneous. They were both stretched out upon their backs, their limbs extended, and their hands wide open. 
no contraction or extension of the muscles, no trace of conflict could be perceived. It seemed evident that they had been taken unawares, the more so as their faces expressed the most intense terror. Thus, said the old doctor, we may reasonably suppose that they were stupefied by some entirely unexpected, strange, and frightful spectacle. I have come across this terrified expression depicted upon the faces of dead people more than once. I recollect noticing it upon the features of a woman who died suddenly from the shock she experienced when one of her neighbours, with the view of playing her a trick, entered her house disguised as a ghost. Lecoq followed the physician's explanations, and tried to make them agree with the vague hypotheses that were revolving in his own brain. But who could these individuals be? Would they in death guard the secret of their identity, as the other victim had done? The first subject examined by the physicians was over fifty years of age. His hair was very thin and quite grey, and his face was closely shaven, excepting a thick tuft of hair on his rather prominent chin. He was very poorly clad wearing a soiled woollen blouse and a pair of dilapidated trousers hanging in rags over his boots, which were very much trodden down at the heels. The old doctor declared that this man must have been instantly killed by a bullet. The size of the circular wound, the absence of blood around its edge, and the blackened and burnt state of the flesh demonstrated this fact with almost mathematical precision. The great difference that exists in wounds made by firearms, according to the distance from which the death-dealing missile comes, was seen when the physicians began to examine the last of the murdered men. The ball that had caused the latter's death had scarcely crossed a yard of space before reaching him, and his wound was not nearly so hideous in aspect as the others. This individual, who was at least fifteen years younger than his companion, was short and remarkably ugly his face, which was quite beardless, being pitted all over by the smallpox. His garb was such as is worn by the worst frequenters of the barriere. His trousers were of a grey checked material, and his blouse, turned back at the throat, was blue. It was noticed that his boots had been blackened quite recently. The smart glazed cap that lay on the floor beside him was in harmony with his carefully curled hair and gaudy necktie. These were the only facts that the physician's report set forth in technical terms. This was the only information obtained by the most careful investigation. The two men's pockets were explored and turned inside out, but they contained nothing that gave the slightest clue to their identity, either as regards name, social position, or profession. There was not even the slightest indication on any of these points, not a letter, nor an address, not a fragment of paper, nothing not even such common articles of personal use as a tobacco-pouch, a knife, or a pipe which might be recognised, and thus establish the owner's identity. A little tobacco in a paper bag, a couple of pocket-handkerchiefs that were unmarked, a packet of cigarettes, these were the only articles discovered beyond the money which the victims carried loose in their pockets. On this point it should be mentioned that the elder man had sixty-seven francs about him, and the younger one two louis. Rarely had the police found themselves in the presence of so strange an affair without the slightest clue to guide them. Of course there was the fact itself, as evidenced by the bodies of the three victims, but the authorities were quite ignorant of the circumstances that had attended, and of the motive that had inspired the crime. Certainly they might hope, with the powerful means of investigation at their disposal, to finally arrive at the truth in the course of time, and after repeated efforts. But in the meanwhile all was mystery and so strangely did the case present itself, that it could not safely be said who was really responsible for the horrible tragedy at the Poivriere. The murderer had certainly been arrested, but if he persisted in his obstinacy how were they to ascertain his name? He protested that he had merely killed in self-defence. How could it be shown that such was not the case? Nothing was known concerning the victims, one of whom had with his dying breath accused himself. Then, again, an inexplicable influence tied the widow Chupin's tongue. Two women, one of whom had lost an earring valued at five thousand francs, had witnessed the struggle, then disappeared. An accomplice, after two acts of unheard-of audacity, had also made his escape. And all these people, the women, the murderer, the keeper of the saloon, the accomplice and the victims, were equally strange and mysterious, equally liable not to be what they seemed. 
Perhaps the commissary of police thought he would spend a very unpleasant quarter of an hour at the prefecture when he reported the case. Certainly he spoke of the crime in a very despondent tone. "'It will now be best,' he said at last, "'to transport these three bodies to the morgue. There they will doubtless be identified.' He reflected for a moment, and then added, "'And to think that one of these dead men is perhaps Lacheneur himself.' "'That is scarcely possible,' said Lecoq. "'The spurious soldier, being the last to die, had seen his companions fall. "'If he had supposed Lacheneur to be dead, he would not have spoken of vengeance.' "'Gavrol, who for the past two hours had pretended to pay no attention to the proceedings, now approached. "'He was not the man to yield even to the strongest evidence. "'If Monsieur the Commissary will listen to me, he shall hear my opinion, "'which is a trifle more definite than Monsieur Lecoq's fancies.' Before he could say any more, the sound of a vehicle stopping before the door of the cabin interrupted him, and an instant afterward the investigating magistrate entered the room. End of section 9section 10 of Monsieur Lecoq, part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Monsieur Lecoq by Émile Gaborio Part 1, Section 10 All the officials assembled at the Poivrière knew at least by sight the magistrate who now made his appearance, and Gevrol, an old habitué of the Palais de Justice, mechanically murmured his name, Monsieur Maurice Descoval. He was the son of that famous Baron d'Escoval, who, in 1815, sealed his devotion to the Empire with his blood, and upon whom Napoleon, in the memorial of St. Helena, pronounced this magnificent eulogium. Men as honest as he may, I believe, exist, but more honest? No, it is not possible. Having entered upon his duties as magistrate early in life, and being endowed with remarkable talents, it was at first supposed that the younger d'Escoval would rise to the most exalted rank in his profession. But he had disappointed all such prognostications by resolutely refusing the more elevated positions that were offered to him, in order to retain his modest but useful functions in the public prosecutor's offices at Paris. To explain his repeated refusals, he said that life in the capital had more charms for him than the most enviable advancement in provincial centres. But it was hard to understand this declaration, for, in spite of his brilliant connections and large fortune, he had, ever since the death of his eldest brother, led a most retired life, his existence merely being revealed by his untiring labours, and the good he did to those around him. He was now about forty-two years of age, but appeared much younger, although a few furrows already crossed his brow. One would have admired his face had it not been for the puzzling immobility that marred its beauty, the sarcastic curl of his thin lips, and the gloomy expression of his pale blue eyes. To say that he was cold and grave did not express the truth, it was saying too little. He was gravity and coldness personified, with a shade of hauteur added. Impressed by the horror of the scene, the instant he placed his foot upon the threshold, M. d'Escoval acknowledged the presence of the physicians and the commissary by a slight nod of the head. The others in the room had no existence, so far as he was concerned. At once his faculties went to work. He studied the ground, and carefully noted all the surroundings with the attentive sagacity of a magistrate who realises the immense weight of even the slightest detail, and who fully appreciates the eloquence of circumstantial evidence. "'This is a serious affair,' he said gravely. "'Very serious.' The commissary's only response was to lift his eyes to heaven, a gesture that plainly implied, "'I quite agree with you.' The fact is that for the past two hours the worthy commissary's responsibility had weighed heavily upon him, and he secretly blessed the investigating magistrate for relieving him of it. "'The public prosecutor was unable to accompany me,' resumed M. d'Escoval. "'He has not the gift of omnipresence, and I doubt if it will be possible for him to join me here. Let us, therefore, begin operations at once.' The curiosity of those present had become intense, and the commissary only expressed the general feeling, when he said, "'You have undoubtedly questioned the murderer, sir, and have learnt—' "'I have learnt nothing,' 
interrupted M. d'Escoval, apparently much astonished at the interruption. He took a chair and sat himself down, and while his clerk was busy in authenticating the commissary's procès verbal, he began to read the report prepared by Lecoq. Pale, agitated, and nervous, the young police agent tried to read upon the magistrate's impassive face the impression produced by the document. His future depended upon the magistrate's approval or disapproval, and it was not with a fuddled mind like that of Father Absinthe that he had now to deal, but with a superior intelligence. "'If I could only plead my own cause,' he thought, "'what are cold-written phrases in comparison with spoken living words, palpitating with emotion and imbued with the convictions of the speaker?' However, he was soon reassured. The magistrate's face retained its immobility, but again and again did M. d'Escoval nod his head, in token of approval, and occasionally some point more ingenious than the others, extorted from his lips the exclamations, "'Not bad! Very good!' When he had finished the perusal, he turned to the commissary and remarked, "'All this is very unlike your report of this morning, which represented the affair as a low broil between a party of miserable vagabonds.' The observation was only too just and fair, and the commissary deeply regretted that he had trusted to Gavrol's representations and remained in bed. "'This morning,' he responded evasively, "'I only gave you my first impressions. These have been modified by subsequent researches, so that—' "'Oh,' interrupted the magistrate, "'I did not intend to reproach you. On the contrary, I must congratulate you. One could not have done better nor acted more promptly.' The investigation that has been carried out shows great penetration and research, and the results are given with unusual clearness and wonderful precision. Lecoq's head whirled. The commissary hesitated for an instant. At first he was sorely tempted to confiscate this praise to his own profit. If he drove away the unworthy thought, it was because he was an honest man, and more than that, because he was not displeased to have the opportunity to do Gavrol a bad turn, and punish him for his presumptuous folly. "'I must confess,' he said with some embarrassment, "'that the merit of this investigation does not belong to me. "'To whom, then, shall I attribute it?' "'To the inspector?' thought Mr. d'Escoval, not without surprise, "'for having occasionally employed Gavrol, "'he did not expect from him such ingenuity and sagacity "'as was displayed in this report. "'Is it you, then, who have conducted this investigation so ably?' "'Upon my word, no,' responded Inspector Gavrol. I myself am not so clever as all that. I content myself with telling what I actually discover, and I only give proofs when I have them in hand. May I be hung if the grounds of this report have any existence save in the brains of the man who imagined them." Perhaps the inspector really believed what he said, being one of those persons who are blinded by vanity to such a degree that, with the most convincing evidence before their eyes, they obstinately deny it. "'And yet,' insisted the magistrate, these women whose footprints have been detected must have existed. The accomplice who left the flakes of wool adhering to the plank is a real being. This earring is a positive, palpable proof." Gavrol had hard work to refrain from shrugging his shoulders. "'All this can be satisfactorily explained,' he said, without a search of twelve or fourteen hours. That the murderer had an accomplice is possible. The presence of the women is very natural. Wherever there are male thieves you will find female thieves as well. As for the diamond, what does that prove? That the scoundrels had just met with a stroke of good luck, that they had come here to divide their booty, and that the quarrel arose from the division." This was an explanation, and such a plausible one, that M. d'Escoval was silent, reflecting before he announced his decision. "'Decidedly,' he declared at last, "'decidedly I adopt the hypothesis set forth in the report. Who prepared it?' Gavrol's face turned red with anger. "'One of my men,' he replied, a clever, adroit fellow, Monsieur Lecoq. Come forward, Lecoq, that the magistrate may see you." The young man advanced, his lips tightly compressed so as to conceal a smile of satisfaction which almost betrayed itself. Uh, my, "'My report, sir, is only a summary,' he began, but, but I have certain ideas which you will acquaint me with when I ask for them," interrupted the magistrate, and oblivious of Lecoq's chagrin, he drew from his clerk's portfolio two forms which he filled up and handed to Gavrol, saying, "'Here are two orders. Take them to the station, 
where the murderer and the landlady of this cabin are confined, and have them conducted to the prefecture, where they will be privately examined. Having given these directions, M. d'Escorval was turning toward the physicians, when Lecoq, at the risk of a second rebuff, interposed, "'May I venture, sir, to beg of you to confide this message to me?' he asked of the investigating magistrate. "'Impossible. I may have need of you here. I, I desired, sir, to collect certain evidence, and an opportunity to do so may not present itself again.' The magistrate perhaps fathomed the young man's motive. "'Then let it be so,' he replied, "'but after your task is completed you must wait for me at the prefecture, where I shall proceed as soon as I have finished here. You may go.' Lecoq did not wait for the order to be repeated. He snatched up the papers, and hastened away. He literally flew over the ground, and, strange to say, he no longer experienced any fatigue from the labours of the preceding night. Never had he felt so strong and alert either in body or mind. He was very hopeful of success. He had every confidence in himself, and his happiness would indeed have been complete if he had had another judge to deal with. But M. d'Escorval overawed him to such a degree that he became almost paralysed in his presence. With what a disdainful glance the magistrate had surveyed him! With what an imperious tone he had imposed silence upon him, and that, too, when he had found his work deserving of commendation! Still, never mind, the young detective mentally exclaimed, no one ever tastes perfect happiness here below. And, concentrating all his thoughts on the task before him, he hurried on his way. End of section 10、section、seven of Monsieur Le Coq, Part、one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Spike Holcomb. Monsieur Le Coq by Emile Gaboriau. Part I, Section 7. When, after a rapid walk of twenty minutes, Le Coq reached the police station near the Barriere d'Italie, the doorkeeper, with his pipe in his mouth, Was pacing slowly to and fro before the guard house. His thoughtful air and the anxious glances he cast every now and then toward one of the little grated windows of the building sufficed to indicate that some very rare bird indeed had been entrusted to his keeping. As soon as he recognized Lecoq, his brow cleared, and he paused in his promenade. Ah, well, he inquired, what news do you bring? I have an order to conduct the prisoners to the prefecture. The keeper rubbed his hands, and his smile of satisfaction plainly implied that he felt a load the less on his shoulders. Capital, capital! he exclaimed. The Black Maria, the prison van, will pass here in less than an hour. We will throw them in and hurry the driver off. Lecoq was obliged to interrupt the keeper's transports of satisfaction. Are the prisoners alone? he inquired. Quite alone. The woman in one cell, the man in the other. This has been a remarkably quiet night for Shrove Sunday. Quite surprising indeed. It is true your hunt was interrupted. You had a drunken man here, however. No, yes, that's true. This morning, just at daybreak. A poor devil was under a great obligation to g e v r o l The involuntary irony of this remark did not escape Lecoq. Yes, under a great obligation indeed, he said with a derisive laugh. You may laugh as much as you like, retorted the keeper. But such is really the case. If it hadn't been for Gevrol, the man would certainly have been run over. And what has become of him? The keeper shrugged his shoulders. You ask me too much, he responded. He was a worthy fellow who had been spending the night at a friend's house, and on coming out into the open air, the wine flew into his head. He told us all about it when he got sober, half an hour afterward. I never saw a man so vexed as he was. He wept and stammered. The father of a family, and at my age, too. Oh, it is shameful! What shall I say to my wife? What will the children think? Did he talk much about his wife? He talked about nothing else. He mentioned her name, Ludosia Le Cadie, or some name of that sort. He declared that he should be ruined if we kept him here. He begged us to send for the commissary, to go to his house, and when we set him free, I thought he would go mad with joy. 
he kissed our hands and thanked us again and again. And did you place him in the same cage as the murderer? inquired Lecoq. Of course. Then they talked with each other. Talked? Why, the drunkard was so gone, I tell you, that he couldn't have said bread distinctly. When he was placed in the cell, bang, he fell down like a log of wood. As soon as he recovered, we let him out. I'm sure they didn't talk to each other. The young police agent had grown very thoughtful. I was evidently right, he murmured. What did you say? inquired the innkeeper. Nothing, replied Lecoq was not inclined to communicate his reflections to the custodian of the guardhouse. These reflections of his were by no means pleasant ones. I was right, he thought. This pretended drunkard was none other than the accomplice. He is evidently an adroit, audacious, cool-headed fellow. While we were tracking his footprints, he was watching us. When we had got to some distance, he was bold enough to enter the hovel. Then he came here and compelled them to arrest him and thanks to an assumption of childish simplicity, he succeeded in finding an opportunity to speak with the murderer. He played his part perfectly. Still, I know that he did play a part, and that is something. I know that one must believe exactly the opposite of what he said. He talked of his family, his wife and children. Hence, he has neither children, wife, nor family. Lecoq suddenly checked himself, remembering that he had no time to waste in conjectures. "'What kind of fellow is this drunkard?' he inquired. "'He was tall and stout, with full, ready cheeks, a pair of white whiskers, small eyes, a broad, flat nose, and a good-natured, jovial manner. "'How old would you suppose him to be?' "'Between forty and fifty. "'Did you form any idea of his profession?' "'It's my opinion that what with his soft cap and his heavy brown overcoat, he must be either a clerk or the keeper of some little shop. Having obtained this description, which agreed with the result of his investigations, Lecoq was about to enter the station-house, when a sudden thought brought him to a standstill. "'I hope this man has had no communication with this widow Chupin,' he exclaimed. The keeper laughed heartily. "'How could he have had me?' he responded. "'Isn't the old woman alone in her cell? Ah, the old wretch! She's been cursing and threatening ever since she arrived.' Never in my whole life have I heard such language as she has used. It has been enough to make the very stones blush. Even the drunken man was so shocked that he went to the grating in the door and told her to be quiet. Lecoq's glance and gesture were so expressive of impatience and wrath that the keeper paused in his recital much perturbed. "'What is the matter?' he stammered. "'Why are you angry?' "'Because,' replied Lecoq furiously, because, not wishing to disclose the real cause of his anger, he entered the station-house, saying that he wanted to see the prisoner. Left alone, the keeper began to swear in his turn. "'These police agents are all alike,' he grumbled. "'They question you, you tell them all they desire to know, and afterward, if you venture to ask them anything, they reply, "'Nothing,' or, "'Because. "'They have too much authority. It makes them proud. Looking through the little latticed window in the door, by which the men on guard watched the prisoners, Lecoq eagerly examined the appearance of the assumed murderer. He was obliged to ask himself if this was really the same man he had seen some hours previously at the Poivriere, standing on the threshold of the inner door and holding the whole squad of police agents in check by the intense fury of his attitude. Now, on the contrary, he seemed, as it were, the personification of weakness and despondency. He was seated on a bench, opposite the grating in the door, his elbows resting on his knees, his chin upon his hand, his underlip hanging low, and his eyes fixed upon vacancy. No, murmured Lecoq, no, this man is not what he seems to be. So saying, he entered the cell. The culprit raised his head, gave the detective an indifferent glance, but did not utter a word. "'Well, how goes it?' asked Lecoq. "'I am innocent,' responded the prisoner, in a hoarse, discordant voice. "'I hope so. I am sure. But that is for the magistrate to decide. I came to see if you wanted anything.' "'No,' replied the murderer, but a second later he changed his mind. "'All the same,' he said, "'I shouldn't mind a crust and a drink of wine.' "'You shall have them,' replied Lecoq. 
who at once went out to forage in the neighborhood for eatables of some sort. In his opinion, if the murderer had asked for a drink, after at first refusing to partake of anything, it was solely with the view of conveying the idea that he was really the kind of man he pretended to be. At all events, whoever he might be, the prisoner ate with an excellent appetite. He then took up the large glass of wine that had been brought him, drained it slowly, and remarked, "'That's capital! There can be nothing to beat that!' This seeming satisfaction greatly disappointed Lecoq who had selected, as a test, one of those horribly thick, bluish, nauseous mixtures in vogue around the barriere, hoping, nay, almost expecting, that the murderer would not drink it without some sign of repugnance. And yet the contrary proved the case. However, the young detective had no time to ponder over the circumstance, for a rumble of wheels now announced the approach of that lugubrious vehicle, the Black Maria. When the widow Chupin was removed from her cell, she fought and scratched and cried, Murder! at the top of her voice, and it was only by sheer force that she was at length got into the van. Then it was that the officials turned to the assassin. Lecoq certainly expected some sign of repugnance now, and he watched the prisoner closely. But he was again doomed to disappointment. The culprit entered the vehicle in the most unconcerned manner, and took possession of his compartment like one accustomed to it, knowing the most comfortable position to assume in such close quarters. "'Ah, what an unfortunate morning!' murmured Lecoq disconsolately. "'Still, I will lie in wait for him at the prefecture.'" End of section 7 Recording by Spike Holcomb Section 12 of Monsieur Lecoq, Part 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Spike Holcomb. Monsieur Lecoq by Emile Gaboriau, Part 1, Section 12. When the door of the prison van had been securely closed, the driver cracked his whip, and the sturdy horses started off at a brisk trot. Lecoq had taken his seat in front, between the driver and the guard, but his mind was so engrossed with his own thoughts that he heard nothing of their conversation, which was very jovial, although frequently interrupted by the shrill voice of the widow Chupin, who sang and yelled her imprecations alternately. It is needless, however, to recapitulate her oaths. Let us rather follow the train of Lecoq's meditation. By what means could he secure some clue to the murderer's identity? He was still convinced that the prisoner must belong to the higher ranks of society. After all, it was not so extraordinary that he should have succeeded in feigning an appetite, that he should have concealed his distaste for a nauseous beverage, and that he should have entered the Black Maria without hesitation. Such conduct was quite possible, indeed almost probable on the part of a man endowed with considerable strength of will, and realizing the imminence of his peril. But granting this, would he be equally able to hide his feelings when he was obliged to submit to the humiliating formalities that awaited him, formalities which, in certain cases, can, and must, be pushed even to the verge of insult and outrage. No, Lecoq could not believe that this would be possible. He felt sure that the disgraceful position in which the prisoner would find himself would cause him to revolt, to lose his self-control, to utter some word that might give the desired clue. It was not until the gloomy vehicle had turned off the Pont Neuf on to the Quai de l'Horloge that the young detective became conscious of what was transpiring around him. Soon the van passed through an open gateway and drew up in a small, damp courtyard. Lecoq immediately alighted and opened the door of the compartment in which the supposed murderer was confined, exclaiming as he did so, "'Here we are! Get out!' There was no fear of the prisoner escaping. The iron gate had been closed, and at least a dozen agents were standing near at hand, waiting to have a look at the new arrivals. The prisoner slowly stepped to the ground. His expression of face remained unchanged, and each gesture evinced the perfect indifference of a man accustomed to such ordeals. Lecoq scrutinized his demeanor as attentively as an anatomist might have watched the action of a muscle. He noted that the prisoner seemed to experience a sensation of satisfaction 
directly his foot touched the pavement of the courtyard, that he drew a long breath, and then stretched and shook himself, as if to regain the elasticity of his limbs, cramped by confinement in the narrow compartment from which he had just emerged. Then he glanced around him, and a scarcely perceptible smile played upon his lips. One might have sworn that the place was familiar to him, that he was well acquainted with these high, grim walls, these grated windows, these heavy doors, in short, with all the sinister belongings of a prison. "'Good Lord!' murmured Lecoq, greatly chagrined. "'Does he indeed recognize the place?' And his sense of disappointment and disquietude increased, when, without waiting for a word, a motion, or a sign, the prisoner turned toward one of the five or six doors that opened into the courtyard. Without an instant's hesitation, he walked straight toward the very doorway he was expected to enter. Lecoq asked himself, was it chance? But his amazement and disappointment increased tenfold when, after entering the gloomy corridor, he saw the culprit proceed some little distance, resolutely turn to the left, pass by the keeper's room, and finally enter the register's office. An old offender could not have done better. Big drops of perspiration stood on Lecoq's forehead. This man, thought he, has certainly been here before. He knows the ropes. The registrar's office was a large room heated almost to suffocation by an immense stove, and badly lighted by three small windows, the panes of which were covered with a thick coating of dust. There sat the clerk reading a newspaper, spread out over the open register, that fatal book in which are inscribed the names of all those whom misconduct, crime, misfortune, madness, or error have brought to these grim portals. Three or four attendants, who were awaiting the hour for entering upon their duties, reclined half asleep upon the wooden benches that lined three sides of the room. These benches, with a couple of tables and some dilapidated chairs, constituted the entire furniture of the office in one corner of which stood a measuring machine, under which each culprit was obliged to pass, the exact height of the prisoners being recorded in order that their description of their persons might be complete in every respect. At the entrance of the culprit accompanied by Lecoq, the clerk raised his head. Ah, said he, has the van arrived? Yes, responded Lecoq, and showing the orders signed by M. Descorval, he added, Here are the man's papers. The registrar took the documents and read them. Oh, he exclaimed, a triple assassination. Oh, oh. The glance he gave the prisoner was positively deferential. This was no common culprit, no ordinary vagabond, no vulgar thief. The investigating magistrate orders a private examination, continued the clerk, and I must get the prisoner other clothing, as the things he is wearing now will be used as evidence. Let someone go at once and tell the superintendent that the other occupants of the van must wait. At this moment, the governor of the depot entered the office. The clerk at once dipped his pen in the ink, and turning to the prisoner, he asked, What is your name? May. Your Christian name? I have none. What? You have no Christian name? The prisoner seemed to reflect for a moment, and then answered sulkily, I may as well tell you that you need not tire yourself by questioning me. I shan't answer any one else but the magistrate. You would like to make me cut my own throat, wouldn't you? A very clever trick, of course, but that won't do for me. You must see that you only aggravate your situation, observed the governor. Not in the least. I am innocent. You wish to ruin me. I only defend myself. Get anything more out of me now, if you can. But you had better give me back what they took from me at the station house. My hundred and thirty-six francs and eight sous. I shall need them when I get out of this place. I want you to make a note of them on the register. Where are they? The money had been given to Lecoq by the keeper of the station house, who had found it upon the prisoner when he was placed in his custody. Lecoq now laid it upon the table. Here are your hundred and thirty-six francs and eight sous, said he, and also your knife, your handkerchief, and four cigars. An expression of lively contentment was discernible on the prisoner's features. Now, resumed the clerk, will you answer? 
but the governor perceived the futility of further questioning, and silencing the clerk by a gesture, he told the prisoner to take off his boots. Lecoq thought the assassin's glance wavered as he heard this order. Was it only a fancy? Why must I do that? asked the culprit. To pass under the beam, replied the clerk. We must make a note of your exact height. The prisoner made no reply, but sat down and drew off his heavy boots. The heel of the right one was worn down on the inside. It was, moreover, noticed that the prisoner wore no socks, and that his feet were coated with mud. "'You only wear boots on Sundays, then,' remarked Lecoq. "'Why do you think that? By the mud with which your feet are covered, as high as the ankle-bone.' "'What of that?' exclaimed the prisoner, in an insolent tone. "'Is it a crime not to have a marchioness's feet?' "'It is a crime you are not guilty of, at all events,' said the young detective, slowly. "'Do you think I can't see that if the mud were picked off your feet would be white and neat? The nails have been carefully cut and polished.' He paused. A new idea, inspired by his genius for investigation, had just crossed Lecoq's mind. Pushing a chair in front of the prisoner, and spreading out a newspaper over it, he said, "'Will you place your foot there?' The man did not comply with the request. "'It is useless to resist,' exclaimed the governor. "'We are in force.' The prisoner delayed no longer. He placed his foot on the chair, as he had been ordered, and Lecoq, with the aid of a knife, proceeded to remove the fragments of mud that adhered to the skin. Anywhere else so strange and grotesque a proceeding would have excited laughter, but here, in this gloomy chamber, the anteroom of the Assis court, an otherwise trivial act is fraught with serious import. Nothing astonishes, and should a smile threaten to curve one's lips, it is instantly repressed. All the spectators, from the governor of the prison to the keepers, had witnessed many other incidents equally absurd. And no one thought of inquiring the detective's motive. This much was known already, that the prisoner was trying to conceal his identity. Now it was necessary to establish it at any cost, and Lecoq had probably discovered some means of attaining this end. The operation was soon concluded, and Lecoq swept the dust off the paper into the palm of his hand. He divided it into two parts— enclosing one portion in a scrap of paper and slipping it into his own pocket. With the remainder he formed a package which he handed to the governor, saying, I beg you, sir, to take charge of this, and to seal it up here in presence of the prisoner. This formality is necessary, so that by and by he may not pretend that the dust has been changed. The governor complied with the request, and as he placed this bit of proof, as he styled it, in a small satchel for safekeeping, the prisoner shrugged his shoulders with a sneering laugh. Still, beneath this cynical gaiety, Lecoq thought he could detect poignant anxiety. Chance owed him the compensation of this slight triumph, for previous events had deceived all his calculations. The prisoner did not offer the slightest objection when he was ordered to undress and to exchange his soiled and blood-stained garments for the clothing furnished by the government. Not a muscle of his face moved while he submitted his person to one of those ignominious examinations which make the blood rush to the forehead of the lowest criminal. It was with perfect indifference that he allowed an inspector to comb his hair and beard and to examine the inside of his mouth, so as to make sure that he had not concealed either some fragment of glass, by the aid of which captives can sever the strongest bars or one of those microscopical bits of lead with which prisoners write the notes they exchange, rolled up in a morsel of bread and called postillion. These formalities having been concluded, the superintendent rang for one of the keepers. "'Conduct this man to number three of the secret cells,' he ordered. There was no need to drag the prisoner away. He walked out as he had entered, preceding the guard like some old habitue. Who knows where he is going? What a rascal! exclaimed the clerk. Then you think, began Lecoq, baffled but not convinced. Ah, there can be no doubt of it, declared the governor. This man is certainly a dangerous criminal, an old offender. 
I think I have seen him before. I could almost swear to it. Thus it was evident these people, with their long, varied experience, shared Gevrol's opinion. Lecoq stood alone. He did not discuss the matter. What good would it have done? Besides, the widow Chupin was just being brought in. The journey must have calmed her nerves, for she had become as gentle as a lamb. It was in a wheedling voice and with tearful eyes that she called upon these good gentlemen to witness the shameful injustice with which she was treated. She, an honest woman. Was she not the mainstay of her family? Since her son Polite was in custody, charged with pocket-picking, hence what would become of her daughter-in-law and her grandson Toto, who had no one to look after them but her? Still, when her name had been taken, and a keeper was ordered to remove her, nature reasserted itself, and scarcely had she entered the corridor than she was heard quarrelling with the guard. "'You are wrong not to be polite,' she said. "'You are losing a good fee. Without counting many a good drink I would stand you when I get out of here.' Lecoq was now free until Monsieur d'Escorval's arrival. He wandered through the gloomy corridors from office to office, but finding himself assailed with questions by everyone he came across, he eventually left the depot, and went and sat down on one of the benches beside the quay. Here he tried to collect his thoughts. His convictions were unchanged. He was more than ever convinced that the prisoner was concealing his real social standing. But on the other hand, it was evident he was well acquainted with the prison and its usages. He had also proved himself to be endowed with far more cleverness than Lecoq had supposed. What self-control! What powers of dissimulation he had displayed! He had not so much as frowned while undergoing the severest ordeals, and he had managed to deceive the most experienced eyes in Paris. The young detective had waited during nearly three hours, as motionless as the bench on which he was seated, and so absorbed in studying his case that he had thought neither of the cold nor of the flight of time, when a carriage drew up before the entrance of the prison, and Monsieur d'Escorval alighted, followed by his clerk. Lecoq rose and hastened, well-nigh breathless with anxiety, towards the magistrate. "'My researches on this spot,' said this functionary, "'confirm me in the belief that you are right. "'Is there anything fresh?' "'Yes, sir. "'A fact that is apparently very trivial, though, in truth. "'It is of importance that—' "'Very well,' interrupted the magistrate. "'You will explain it to me by and by. First of all, I must summarily examine the prisoners. "'A mere matter of form for today. "'Wait for me here.' Although the magistrate promised to make haste, Lecoq expected that at least an hour would elapse before he reappeared. In this he was mistaken. Twenty minutes later, Monsieur d'Escorval emerged from the prison without his clerk. He was walking very fast, and instead of approaching the young detective, he called to him at some little distance. "'I must return home at once,' he said, instantly. "'I cannot listen to you.' "'But, sir!' "'Enough!' The bodies of the victims have been taken to the morgue. Keep a sharp lookout there. Then, this evening, make, well, do whatever you think best. But, sir, I must. Tomorrow, tomorrow, at nine o'clock, in my office in the Palais de Justice. Lecoq wished to insist upon a hearing, but Monsieur d'Escorval had entered, or rather, thrown himself into his carriage, and the coachman was already whipping up the horse. And to think that he's an investigating magistrate, panted Lecoq left spellbound on the quay. Has he gone mad? As he spoke, an uncharitable thought took possession of his mind. Can it be, he murmured, that Monsieur de Scorval holds the key to the mystery? Perhaps he wishes to get rid of me. The suspicion was so terrible that Lecoq hastened back to the prison, hoping that the prisoner's bearing might help to solve his doubts. On peering through the grated aperture in the door of the cell, he perceived the prisoner lying on the pallet that stood opposite the door. His face would turn toward the wall, and he was enveloped in the coverlid up to his eyes. He was not asleep, for Lecoq could detect a strange movement of the body, which puzzled and annoyed him. On applying his ear instead of his eye to the aperture, he distinguished a stifled moan. There could no longer be any doubt. The death-rattle was sounding in the prisoner's throat. "'Help! help!' cried Lecoq, greatly excited. 
The prisoner is killing himself. A dozen keepers hastened to the spot. The door was quickly opened, and it was then ascertained that the prisoner, having torn a strip of binding from his clothes, has fastened it round his neck and tried to strangle himself with the assistance of a spoon that had been left with his food. He was already unconscious, and the prison doctor, who immediately bled him, declared that it had another ten minutes elapsed. Help would have arrived too late. When the prisoner regained his senses, he gazed around him with a wild, puzzled stare. One might have supposed that he was amazed to find himself still alive. Suddenly a couple of big tears welled from his swollen eyelids and rolled down his cheeks. He was pressed with questions, but did not vouchsafe so much as a single word in response. As he was in such a desperate frame of mind, and as the orders to keep him in solitary confinement prevented the governor giving him a companion, it was decided to put a straight waistcoat on him. Lecoq assisted at the operation, and then walked away, puzzled, thoughtful, and agitated. Intuition told him that these mysterious occurrences concealed some terrible drama. "'Still, what can have occurred since the prisoner's arrival here?' he murmured. "'Has he confessed his guilt to the magistrate? Or what is his reason for attempting so desperate an act?' End of section 12 Recording by Spike Holcomb Section 13 of Monsieur Lecoq, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain, and for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Don Evans. Monsieur Lecoq by Emile Gaborio, Part 1, Section 13. Lecoq did not sleep that night, although he had been on his feet for more than forty hours, and had scarcely paused either to eat or drink. Anxiety, hope, and even fatigue itself had imparted to his body the fictitious strength of fever, and to his intellect the unhealthy acuteness which is often the result of intense mental effort. He no longer had to occupy himself with imaginary deductions, as in former times when in the employ of his patron, the astronomer. Once again did the fact prove stranger than fiction. Here was reality, a terrible reality personified by the corpses of three victims lying on the marble slabs at the morgue. Still, if the catastrophe itself was a patent fact, its motive, its surroundings, could only be conjectured. Who could tell what circumstances had preceded and paved the way for this tragical denouement? It is true that all doubt might be dispelled by one discovery, the identity of the murderer. Who was he? Who was right? Gevrol or Lecoq? The former's views were shared by the officials at the prison. The latter stood alone. Again, the former's opinion was based upon formidable proof the evidence of sight, while Lecoq's hypothesis rested only on a series of subtle observations and deductions starting from a single sentence that had fallen from the prisoner's lips. And yet Lecoq resolutely persisted in his theory, guided by the following reasons. He learnt from M. d'Escorval's clerk that when the magistrate had examined the prisoner, the latter not only refused to confess, but answered all the questions put to him in the most evasive fashion. In several instances, moreover, he had not replied at all. If the magistrate had not insisted, it was because this first examination was a mere formality, solely intended to justify the somewhat premature delivery of the order to imprison the accused. Now under these circumstances, how was one to explain the prisoner's attempt at self-destruction? Prison statistics show that habitual offenders do not commit suicide. When apprehended for a criminal act, they are sometimes seized with a wild frenzy and suffer repeated nervous attacks. At others they fall into a dull stupor, just as some glutted beast succumbs to sleep with the blood of his prey still dripping from his lips. However, such men never think of putting an end to their days. They hold fast to life, no matter how seriously they may be compromised. 
in truth they are cowards on the other hand the unfortunate fellow who in a moment of frenzy commits a crime not unfrequently seeks to avoid the consequences of his act by self-destruction hence the prisoner's frustrated attempt at suicide was a strong argument in favor of lecoq's theory this wretched man's secret must be a terrible one since he held it dearer than life since he had tried to destroy himself that he might take it unrevealed to the grave four o'clock was striking when lecoq sprang from his bed on which he had thrown himself without undressing and five minutes later he was walking down the rue montmartre the weather was still cold and muggy and a thick fog hung over the city but the young detective was too engrossed with his own thoughts to pay attention to any atmospherical unpleasantness walking with a brisk stride he had just reached the church of saint eustache when a coarse mocking voice accosted him with the exclamation aha my fine fellow he looked up and perceived chevreul who with three of his men had come to cast his nets round about the markets whence the police generally returned with a good haul of thieves and vagabonds you are up very early this morning monsieur lecoq continued the inspector you are still trying to discover our man's identity i suppose still trying is he a prince in disguise or only a marquis uh, one or the other i am quite certain all right then in that case you will not refuse us the opportunity to drink to your success lecoq consented and the party entered a wine shop close by when the glasses were filled lecoq turned to chevreul and exclaimed upon my word general our meeting will save me a long walk i was going to the prefecture to request you on m d'escorval's behalf to send one of our comrades to the morgue this morning the affair at the poivriere has been noised about and all the world will be there so he desires some officer to be present to watch the crowd and listen to the remarks of the visitors all right father absinthe shall be there when the doors open to send father absinthe where a shrewd and subtle agent was required was a mockery still lecoq did not protest for it was better to be badly served than to be betrayed and he could at least trust father absinthe it doesn't much matter continued chevreul but you should have informed me of this last evening however when i reached the prefecture you had gone i had some work to do yes at the station-house near the barriere d'italie i wanted to know whether the floor of the cell was paved or tiled so saying lecoq paid the score saluted his superior officer and went out thunder exclaimed chevreul striking his glass violently upon the counter thunder how that fellow provokes me he does not know the a b c of his profession when he can't discover anything he invents wonderful stories and then misleads the magistrates with his high-sounding phrases in the hope of gaining promotion i'll give him advancement with a vengeance i'll teach him to set himself above me lecoq had not been deceived the evening before he had visited the station house where the prisoner had first been confined and had compared the soil of the cell floor with the dust he had placed in his pocket and he carried away with him as he believed one of those crushing proofs that often suffice to extort from the most obstinate criminal a complete confession if lecoq was in haste to part company with chevreul it was because he was anxious to pursue his investigation still further before appearing in m d'escorval's presence he was determined to find the cab-driver who had been stopped by the two women in the rue de chevalera and with his object in view he had obtained at the prefecture the names and addresses of all the cab-owners hiring between the road to fontainebleau and the seine his earlier efforts at investigation proved unsuccessful at the first establishment he visited the stable boys who were not yet up swore at him roundly and in the second he found the grooms at work but none of the drivers had as yet put in an appearance moreover the owner refused to show him the books upon which are recorded or should be recorded each driver's daily engagements 
Lecoq was beginning to despair, when at about half-past seven o'clock he reached an establishment just beyond the fortifications belonging to a man named Trijal. Here he learned that on Sunday night, or rather early on Monday morning, one of the drivers had been accosted on his way home by some persons who succeeded in persuading him to drive them back into Paris. This driver, who was then in the courtyard harnessing his horse, proved to be a little old man with a ruddy complexion and a pair of small eyes full of cunning. Lecoq walked up to him at once. "'Was it you,' he asked, "'who on Sunday night, or rather on Monday, between one and two in the morning, drove a couple of women from the Rue de Chevalera into Paris?' The driver looked up and, surveying Lecoq attentively, cautiously replied, perhaps it is a positive answer that i want aha uh -huh, said the old man sneeringly you know two ladies who have lost something in a cab and so the young detective trembled with satisfaction this man was certainly the one he was looking for have you heard anything about a crime that has been committed in the neighborhood he interrupted yes a murderer in a low wine shop well, then, I will tell you that these two women are mixed up in it. They fled when we entered the place, and I am trying to find them. I am a detective. Here is my card. Now can you give me any information? The driver had grown very pale. Ah, the wretches! he exclaimed. I am no longer surprised at the luck money they gave me. A louis and a two five-franc pieces for the fare. Thirty francs in all. Curse it, money! If I hadn't spent it, I'd throw it away. And where did you drive them? To the Rue de Bourgogne. I have forgotten the number, but I should recognize the house. Unfortunately, they would not have let you drive them to their own door. Who knows? I saw them ring the bell, and I think they went in just as I drove away. Shall I take you there? The cock's sole response was to spring onto the box, exclaiming, Let us be off! End of section 13. Recorded by Don Evans. www.donmevans.com Section 14 of Monsieur Lecoq, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Don Evans. Monsieur Lecoq by Emile Gaboriau. Part One. Section Fourteen. It was not to be supposed that the women who had escaped from the widow Chupin's drinking den at the moment of the murder were utterly devoid of intelligence, nor was it at all likely that these two fugitives, conscious as they were of their perilous situation, had gone straight to their real home in a vehicle hired on the public highway. Hence the driver's hope of finding them in the Rue de Bourgogne was purely chimerical. Lecoq was fully aware of this, and yet he did not hesitate to jump on to the box and give the signal for starting. In so doing, he obeyed a maxim which he had framed in his early days of meditation, a maxim intended to assure his after-fame, and which ran as follows. Always suspect that which seems probable, and begin by believing what appears incredible. As soon as the vehicle was well under way, the young detective proceeded to ingratiate himself into the driver's good graces, being anxious to obtain all the information that this worthy was able to impart. In a tone that implied that all trifling would be useless, the cabman cried, "'Hey up! Hey up, cocotte!' and his mare pricked up her ears and quickened her pace, so that the Rue de Choisy was speedily reached. Then it was that Lecoq resumed his inquiries. "'Well, my good fellow,' he began, "'you have told me the principal facts. Now I should like the details. How did these two women attract your attention?' 
oh it was very simple i had been having a most unfortunate day six hours on a stand on the boulevard with the rain pouring all the time it was simply awful at midnight i had not made more than a franc and a half for myself but i was so wet and miserable and the horse seemed so done up that i decided to go home i did grumble i can tell you well i had just passed the corner of the rue picard in the rue de chevalerie when i saw two women standing under a lamp some little distance off i did not pay any attention to them for when a man is as old as i am women go on said lecoq who could not restrain his impatience i had already passed them when they began to call after me i pretended i did not hear them but one of them ran after the cab crying a louis a louis for yourself i hesitated for a moment when the woman added and ten francs for the fare i then drew up lecoq was boiling over with impatience but he felt that the wisest course was not to interrupt the driver with questions but to listen to all he had to say as you may suppose continued the coachman i wasn't inclined to trust two such suspicious characters alone at that hour and in that part of the city so just as they were about to get into the cab i called to them wait a bit my little friends you have promised papa some sous where are they the one who had called after the cab at once handed me thirty francs saying above all make haste your recital could not be more minute exclaimed lecoq approvingly now how about these two women what do you mean i mean what kind of women did they seem to be what did you take them for no oh, for nothing very good replied the driver with a knowing smile ah and how were they dressed like most of the girls who go to dance at the rainbow one of them however was very neat and prim while the other well she was a terrible dowdy which ran after you the girl who was neatly dressed the one who the driver suddenly paused some vivid remembrance passed through his brain and abruptly jerking the reins he brought his horse to a standstill thunder he exclaimed now i think of it i did notice something strange one of the two women called the other madame as large as life while the other said thee and thou and spoke as if she were somebody oh ho oh, oh, ho oh, exclaimed the young detective in three different keys and which was it that said thee and thou why the dowdy one she with shabby dress and shoes as big as a gouty man's you should have seen her shake the prim-looking girl as if she had been a palm-tree you little fool said she do you want to ruin us you will have time to faint when we get home now come along and then she began to sob indeed madame indeed i can't she said and really she seemed quite unable to move in fact she appeared to be so ill that i said to myself here is a young woman who has drunk more than is good for her these facts confirmed even if they corrected lecoq's first suppositions as he had suspected the social position of the two women was not the same he had been mistaken however in attributing the higher standing to the woman wearing the shoes with the high heels the marks of which he had so particularly noticed in the snow with all the attendant signs of precipitation terror and weakness in reality social preeminence belonged to the woman who had left the large broad footprints behind her and not merely was she of a superior rank but she had also shown superior energy contrary to lecoq's original idea it now seemed evident that she was the mistress and her companion the servant is that all my good fellow he asked the driver 
who during the last few minutes had been busy with his horses yes replied the cabman except that i noticed that the shabbily dressed woman who paid me had a hand as small as a child's and in spite of her anger her voice was as sweet as music did you see her face i just caught a glimpse of it could you tell me if she were pretty or whether she was a blonde or brunette so many questions at a time confused the driver stop a minute he replied in my opinion she wasn't pretty and i don't believe she was young but she certainly was a blonde and with plenty of hair too was she tall or short stout or slender between the two this was very vague and the other asked lecoq the neatly dressed one the deuce as for her i did not notice her at all all i know about her is that she was very small would you recognize her if you met her again good heavens no the vehicle was now rolling along the rue de bourgogne halfway down the street the driver pulled up and turning to lecoq exclaimed here we are that's the house the hussies went into to draw off the silk handkerchief that served him as a muffler to fold it and slip it into his pocket to spring to the ground and enter the house indicated was only the work of an instant for the young detective in the concierge little room he found an old woman knitting lecoq bowed to her politely and displaying the silk handkerchief exclaimed madam i have come to return this article to one of your lodgers to which one really i don't exactly know in a moment the worthy dame imagined that this polite young man was making fun of her you scamp she began excuse me interrupted lecoq allow me to finish i must tell you that at about three o'clock in the morning of the day before yesterday i was quietly returning home when two ladies who were seemingly in a great hurry overtook me and passed on one of them dropped this handkerchief which i picked up i hastened after her to restore it but before i could overtake them they had rung the bell at your door and were already in the house i did not like to ring at such an unearthly hour for fear of disturbing you yesterday i was so busy i couldn't come however here i am at last and here's the handkerchief so saying the cock laid the handkerchief on the table and turned as if to go when the concierge detained him many thanks for your kindness said she but you can keep it we have no ladies in this house who are in the habit of coming home alone after midnight still i have eyes insisted lecoq and i certainly saw ah i had forgotten exclaimed the old woman the night you speak of some one certainly did ring the bell here i pulled the string that opens the door and listened but not hearing anyone close the door or come upstairs i said to myself some mischievous fellow has been playing a trick on me i slipped on my dress and went out into the hall where i saw two women hastening toward the door before i could reach them they slammed the door in my face i opened it again as quickly as i could and looked out into the street but they were hurrying away as fast as they could in what direction oh they were running toward the rue de varin the cock was baffled again however he bowed civilly to the concierge whom he might possibly have need of at another time and then went back to the cab as i had supposed they do not live here he remarked to the driver the latter shrugged his shoulders in evident vexation which would inevitably have vent in a torrent of words if lecoq who had consulted his watch had not forestalled the outburst by saying nine o'clock i am an hour behind time already still i shall have some news to tell now take me to the morgue as quickly as possible end of section fourteen recording by Don Evans www.donmevans.com
Section 15 of Monsieur Lecoq, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Don Evans. Monsieur Lecoq by Emile Gavarillo, Part 1, Section 15. When a mysterious crime has been perpetrated, or a great catastrophe has happened, and the identity of the victims has not been established, a great day invariably follows at the morgue. The attendants are so accustomed to the horrors of the place that the most sickly sight fails to impress them, and even under the most distressing circumstances they hasten gaily to and fro, exchanging jests well calculated to make an ordinary mortal's flesh creep. As a rule, they are far less interested in the corpses laid out for public view on the marble slabs in the principal hall than in the people of every age and station in life who congregate here all day long, at times coming in search of some lost relative or friend, but far more frequently impelled by idle curiosity. As the vehicle conveying Lecoq reached the quay, the young detective perceived that a large, excited crowd was gathered outside the building. The newspapers had reported the tragedy at the widow Chupin's drinking den, of course, more or less correctly, and everybody wished to see the victims. On drawing near the Pont Notre-Dame, Lecoq told the driver to pull up. "'I prefer to alight here rather than in front of the morgue,' he said, springing to the ground. Then, producing first his watch and next his purse, he added, "'We have been an hour and forty minutes, my good fellow. Consequently, I owe you—' "'Nothing at all,' replied the driver decidedly. "'But no, not a sou.' I am too worried already to think that I took the money these hussies offered me. It would only have served me right if the liquor I bought with it had given me the gripes. Don't be uneasy about the score, and if you need a trap, use mine for nothing, till you have caught the jades. As Lecoq's purse was low, he did not insist. You will at least take my name and address, continued the driver. Certainly. The magistrate will want your evidence, and a summons will be sent you. All right. Then address it to Papillon, Eugene, driver, care of Monsieur Trigault. I lodge at his place because I have some small interest in the business, you see. The young detective was hastening away when Papillon called him back. When you leave the morgue, you will want to go somewhere else, he said. You told me that you had another appointment, and that you were already late. Yes, I ought to be at the Palais de Justice, but it is only a few steps from here. No matter. I will wait for you at the corner of the bridge. It's useless to say no. I've made up my mind. And I am a Breton. You know, I want you to ride out the thirty francs that these jades paid me. It would have been cruel to refuse such a request. Accordingly, Lecoq made a gesture of assent, and then hurried toward the morgue. If there was a crowd on the roadway outside, it was because the gloomy building itself was crammed full of people. Indeed, the sightseers, most of whom could see nothing at all, were packed as closely as sardines, and it was only by dint of well-nigh superhuman efforts that Lecoq managed to effect an entrance. As usual, he found among the mob a large number of girls and women, for, strange to say, the Parisian fair sex is rather partial to the disgusting sights and horrible emotions that repay a visit to the morgue. The shop and work girls who reside in the neighborhood readily go out of their way to catch a glimpse of the corpses which crime, accident, and suicide bring to this horrible place. A few, the more sensitive among them, may come no further than the door, but the others enter, and after a long stare, 
return and recount their impressions to their less courageous companions if there should be no corpse exhibited if all the marble slabs are unoccupied strange as it may seem the visitors turn hastily away with an expression of disappointment or discontent there was no fear of their doing so however on the morrow of the tragedy at poivriere for the mysterious murderer whose identity lecoq was trying to establish had furnished three victims for their delectation panting with curiosity they paid but little attention to the unhealthy atmosphere and yet a damp chill came from beyond the iron railings while from the crowd itself rose an infectious vapor impregnated with the stench of the chloride of lime used as a disinfectant as a continuous accompaniment to the exclamations sighs and whispered comments of the bystanders came the murmur of the water trickling from a spigot at the head of each slab a tiny stream that flowed forth only to fall in fine spray upon the marble through the small arched windows a gray light stole in on the exposed bodies bringing each muscle into bold relief revealing the ghastly tints of the lifeless flesh and imparting a sinister aspect to the tattered clothing hung around the room to aid in the identification of the corpses this clothing after a certain time is sold for nothing is wasted at the morgue however lecoq was too occupied with his own thoughts to remark the horrors of the scene he scarcely bestowed a glance on the three victims he was looking for father absinthe whom he could not perceive has gevrol intentionally or unintentionally failed to fulfil his promise or had father absinthe forgotten his duty in his morning dram unable to explain the cause of his comrade's absence lecoq addressed himself to the head keeper it would seem that no one has recognized the victims he remarked no one and yet ever since opening we have had an immense crowd if i were master here on days like this i would charge an admission fee of two sous a head with half price for children it would bring in a round sum more than enough to cover the expenses the keeper's reply seemed to offer an inducement to conversation but lecoq did not seize it excuse me he interrupted didn't the detective come here this morning yes there was one here has he gone away then i don't see him anywhere the keeper glanced suspiciously at his eager questioner but after a moment's hesitation he ventured to inquire are you one of them yes i am replied lecoq exhibiting his card in support of his assertion and your name is lecoq the keeper's face brightened up in that case said he i have a letter for you written by your comrade who was obliged to go away here it is the young detective at once tore open the envelope and read monsieur lecoq monsieur this simple formula of politeness brought a faint smile to his lips was it not on father absinthe's part an evident recognition of his colleague's superiority indeed our hero accepted it as a token of unquestioning devotion which it would be his duty to repay with a master's kind protection toward his first disciple however he had no time to waste in thought and accordingly at once proceeded to peruse the note which ran as follows monsieur lecoq i had been standing on duty since the opening of the morgue when at about nine o'clock three young men entered arm in arm from their manner and appearance i judged them to be clerks in some store or warehouse suddenly i noticed that one of them turned as white as his shirt and calling the attention of his companions to one of the unknown victims he whispered gustave his comrades put their hands over his mouth and one of them exclaimed what are you about you fool to mix yourself up with this affair do you want to get us into trouble 
Thereupon they went out, and I followed them. But the person who had first spoken was so overcome that he could scarcely drag himself along, and his companions were obliged to take him to a little restaurant close by. I entered it myself, and it is there I write this letter. In the meantime, watching them out of the corner of my eye. I send this note explaining my absence to the head keeper who will give it to you. You will understand that I am going to follow these men. A. B. S. The handwriting of this letter was almost illegible, and there were mistakes in spelling in well-nigh every line. Still, its meaning was clear and exact and could not fail to excite the most flattering hopes lecoq's face was so radiant when he returned to the cab that as the old coachman urged on his horse he could not refrain from saying things are going on to suit you a friendly hush was the only response it required all lecoq's attention to classify the new information when he alighted from the cab in front of the Palais de Justice, he experienced considerable difficulty in dismissing the old cabman, who insisted upon remaining at his orders. He succeeded at last, however, but even when he had reached the portico on the left side of the building, the worthy fellow, standing up, still shouted at the top of his voice, "'At Monsieur Trigault's house! Don't forget! Father Papillon!' number nine nine eight one thousand less two lecoq had entered the left wing of the palais he climbed the stairs till he had reached the third floor and was about to enter the long narrow badly lighted corridor known as the galerie d'instruction when finding a doorkeeper installed behind a heavy oaken desk he remarked monsieur d'escorval is of course in his office the man shook his head. No, said he, Monsieur d'Escorval is not here this morning, and he won't be here for several weeks. Why not? What do you mean? Last night, as he was alighting from his carriage at his own door, he had a most unfortunate fall and broke his leg. End of section 15. Recording by Don Evans. W. W. W dot don m evans dot com